Number five on this list is the House of Wills, a historic mansion with a deep history and an even deeper haunting. The Atlanta Journal-Constitution says it was built in 1898 by the Germania Trevernian Social Club, according to the website of the current owner, Cleveland artist Eric Freeman. By 1912, it was turned into the Hospital for Immigrants, and by 1920, it housed the Cleveland Hebrew Institute until 1938, prominent African-American entrepreneur and businessman John Walker Wills bought the property in 1942 to use as the location for his second funeral parlor. Wills died in a home in 1971 and his family sold it in 2005. The home fell into disrepair until Freeman bought it in 2010 and started the challenging work of restoring and renovating the property. Freeman said on his website that Wills is believed to be one of the many ghosts that haunt the house and on his Facebook page he posted a scary electronic voice phenomena or EVP recording from the house of what sounds like dozens of of spirits from beyond trying to be heard by the living. There have actually been some famous paranormal investigators that have looked into this mansion before and they all came to the same conclusion. It's haunted. A swirling mist will occasionally appear in the mansion, followed by stark temperature changes and a horribly foreboding sensation. Visitors who've stayed at this mansion for extended periods of time say that the visit changed them. That they're sort of constantly on alert after that stay, as if they're hyper aware all of the time. Unless you're trying to feel anxious literally all of the time, I'd book another place to stay if I was you. Number four on this list is the Seely Rose House. This house is located in the Malabar Farm State Park, which is in Richland County. To this day, it's still a working farm, which is kind of shocking considering the horrible tragedy that occurred here many years ago. Seely Rose is actually the name of a person, a young girl who lived in the late 1800s. This girl wasn't innocent and sweet as the stereotypical farm gal is. She was evil. There used to be a neighbor house right nearby the Seely Rose house, and in that home lived a young boy around the same age as Seely. Seely developed quite the crush on him and wanted to marry him. It seemed that he liked her as well and he wanted to do the same. This was all fine and good, except her family wouldn't allow it. Seely's family forbid her from marrying this boy, and this was what caused her to do what she did next. Seely wouldn't accept this answer and took it on herself to get rid of the problem, her family. She poisoned them. Every single one of them. She did it by soaking flypaper in water and then secretly pouring the arsenic-laced water over the cottage cheese she served them, according to Ohio State Park News. They all died soon afterwards, except for her. This was soon found out by the authorities, and Seely, being as young as she was, wasn't sent to jail, but she was put into a mental institute. She was there until she died many, many years later. This home is supposedly still haunted by her and the ghost of her dead family, though. Scratches and eerie cracks are heard throughout all the time. Many people have reported being attacked while they're here as well. Avoid this home at all costs if you find yourself in Ohio. In at number three, we have First Avenue. Located in downtown Minneapolis, the building which is now home to this nightclub has a rounded front, is painted black, and has white stars on its side walls with the names of many of the musical talents who have done shows in one of these three event rooms found inside. Before it was famous for being a nightclub, the First Avenue was a Greyhound Depot. The First Avenue legend has to do with the building's former self, the Great Art Deco Greyhound Bus Center that opened on 7th Street in 1937. The story goes that a young woman went to the station to meet her boyfriend who was returning home from World War II. When she was informed that he had died in combat, she ran into the restroom and ended her life due to heartbreak. In recent years, multiple First Avenue staffers have reported seeing a ghost in the washroom. The ghost has been reportedly described as a woman always in a green army jacket and sometimes seen dancing at the club, along with other ghosts. Legend says that many homeless people died in the bus station as well, and they can be seen dancing with the women. There have been reports of another spirit haunting the nightclub. The staff has nicknamed this spirit Slippy, while this particular ghost is said to make a balloon appear from nowhere, which then floats up and down the staircase on its own. Dave Schrade, a paranormal investigator, visited First Avenue to assess the paranormal activity in the building multiple times, and has concluded that the building is indeed haunted by many spirits, indicating that the record room is the most active area of the site. While DJs that have played at the venue have reported frequently hearing strange noises through their headphones such as growls, voices and screams, other performers report their equipment being pushed off stage with no explanation. In at number 2 we have Schmidt Brewery. Schmidt Brewery became the largest in Minnesota by 1860, producing 1200 barrels annually and shipping them as far south as Tennessee. It was restructured as the St. Paul Brewing Company in 1898 before being sold to Jacob Schmidt soon after in 1900. Since it's 
opening in 1884, many ghost hunters have visited the Schmidt Brewery to experience some of the many rumoured paranormal activities. The brewery has been the site of many constant, unexplainable instances, from fires to people losing their lives to terrible accidents. This place has seen a lot of scary sights. While the victims of these events linger around to haunt the grounds of the brewery, even though the building is now used as an artist's loft, that doesn't take away the scary history of the Schmidt Brewery. While most of the ghosts that haunt the grounds of the old brewery have to do with ordinary brewery workers dying in terrible accidents, in 1896 two workers lost their lives in an explosion. Furthermore, in 1902 a worker fell down an unmarked elevator shaft. Additionally, in 1904, Matthew Colo, a worker whose job was to light gas lamps in the brewery, lost his life from inhaling flames. Schmidt Brewery has been a St. Paul haunt since 1855 for more than a couple of reasons. When owner Jacob Schmidt took down the original North Star Brewery sign, replacing it with his namesake, Jacob Schmidt Brewing Company. The entire brewery burned down a year later in 1900. Plenty of other bad luck would also follow on the grounds of the brewery, suspected due to the tragic death of many workers of the brewery. And finally, in at number one, we have Four Pals Restaurant. Known as the most haunted restaurant in Minnesota, the Four Pals has a tragic story. Located in St. Paul, Four Pals was a high end restaurant located in Irvine Park, and the restaurant is a beautiful Victorian mansion. Sadly, though, the restaurant is now permanently closed. The dark stories about Four Pals Restaurant hint that the historic mansion is seriously haunted. As the story goes, back in the late 1800s, Joseph Four Pals had an affair with the mansion's maid, Molly. It was not long before his wife discovered this relationship and love for Mary. Therefore, the wife became extremely jealous of the servant and assigned Molly to do chores that would keep her away from the bedrooms and away from Joseph. Molly became pregnant and Joseph ended the affair, but Molly was so distraught about the whole situation that she ended her life. According to reports, she ended her life in the attic. Joseph was upset when he heard the news about Molly that he figured he could not stay in the house where his beloved died. One day he went out for a walk and ended his life as well. Since then, restaurant guests and employees have reported creepy sightings of a woman dressed in 1800s attire, lights turning off and on by themselves, and strange noises coming from the attic. In one case, the disturbances were so chaotic that it led to an investigation by the St. Paul police, whose canine dog refused to enter the attic. It is said that Joseph and Molly both haunt Four Pals, but many guests have said Molly is more active spirit. People say they have seen the two walking around the dining area, but Molly bangs on walls and smashes glasses. Some people say they can smell her lavender perfume. That being said, Mr. Four Pals is also sometimes seen, and his ghost has been reported wearing a dark waistcoat, silk vest, pinstripe trousers, and a derby hat. He can be seen going to the basement at which time the lights flicker and shuffling noises are heard. He roams the house and has been caught on film many times. The former staff of the restaurant have also reported on many occasions when they would go floor by floor turning off lights as they closed down for the night. Then when the staff members get in their cars to leave, they'll notice the top floor light is on. Nevertheless, if the restaurant is haunted, the story of Mr. Forpau and Molly is one of the most devastating to date. Number 5 on this list is Stiver's School for the Arts. This is a high school that's attracted hundreds of artistic students from around the region for years. It's apparently a really good school, however, ever since a murder back in the 1920s, it's been deeply haunted. AGC writes, according to the online magazine Dayton Most Metro, a teacher named Mary Tyler was found dead in the pool with a locket in one hand and a broken pointer in the other. The teacher was reportedly involved with a senior student at the time of her death. He disappeared after her body was found and was never seen again. Officials believe the un named student tore his picture out of the teacher's locket so nobody would suspect him, according to the writer Julian Heisler. The school eventually covered over the pool, building a classroom on top of it. A trap door still leads down into the pool which is used for storage now, Heisler said, but it seems Mary Tyler never left. Students and maintenance staff have reported Tyler's ghostly figure levitating in the abandoned pool and floating about the lower levels and the network of tunnels buried underneath the school, banging on pipes and and wailing loudly wherever she goes, Dayton Most Metro reported. A floating dead body. Yeah, that sounds pretty haunted to me, guys. Ever since this ghostly incident, there have been tons of spooky moments reported by students. Lights flickering, temperature changes, items mysteriously moving around by themselves, and things of this nature happening regularly at this school. It's crazy that something that went down a hundred years ago still has such a hold over this place, but literally a century later, and we still haven't shaken the ghost 
of Mary's Hyler. Hopefully the next century is a little bit less scary for the students at Stiver School for the Arts. Number four on this list is the Cleveland Federal Reserve. The Cleveland Federal Reserve is where the money is. Now this isn't a comment on people being haunted by crippling debt, even though that's probably the most realistic thing I've ever said on this channel. No, this place is haunted by an actual poltergeist that you don't want to mess with. Matilda is the name of our ghost in question and she's said to haunt the vault down below. Now the good thing about this place is that you actually can't even get to the haunted area. So even for those of you who are feeling daring, you aren't going to be able to go and visit Matilda because it's off limits to the public. Matilda used to work here and was deeply involved in the stock market. That's why when the market suffered a horrible crash in 1929, Matilda felt trapped and saw no other way than to take her own life. She did so in this building and now it is forever haunted by her spirit passing through the underground walls, scaring all of those who work down there. It's hard to know how accurate this haunting really is because we don't really have any proof of it. That however is more due to the fact that it's super off limits and super well guarded vault that nobody can get to. If we can trust the verbal accounts of the people who've run into her, and there have been many, then we should definitely fear this vault. Number three on this list is Fort Fisher. Fort Fisher was a critical fort during the American Civil War. It was used by the Confederate Army and was pretty instrumental for them from 1861 to 1865. This fort was used to protect an important trade post there that the Army needed. They defended this place for those four years, but then in 1865, the Union Army came in and was finally able to capture it. This battle was a very bloody one and was actually huge for the Union Army and the overall scope of the war. Apparently, there was a lot of death at this fort and that death it's never really gone away. Now this fort is teeming with paranormal activity. Visitors will often report hearing gunshots coming from thin air. The sounds of many footsteps all running at once as if people were charging ahead. Orbs of energy appear in front of them from no apparent source. There are two very famous ghosts that haunt this place as well. Robert E. Harrell and General William Whitling. Robert was apparently an outcast who died under mysterious circumstances and has not been able to rest since. The General was actually taken prisoner and killed at Fort Columbus, but he returned to this place because he feels regret for how he failed in life. He was apparently responsible for defending this place and was not capable of doing so. A very haunted fort that I wouldn't recommend going to. Number two on this list is Lydia's Bridge. Who is Lydia and why does she have a bridge and why is it haunted? Well, Lydia is quite the famous ghost. This is a true ghost. Like when you think of a ghost and a ghost story, this meets all the criteria for a good one. Spectrum Local News says, People traveling between Jamestown and Greensboro on US Highway 70A said they've encountered the ghost of Lydia, a hitchhiker. If she's picked up, she gets into the car and vanishes before she reaches the requested destination. Various versions of the Lydia legend have been passed along over the years, and there are apparently 11 different versions of the story that are set in North North Carolina. It's common for folks to go ghost hunting for Lydia near the bridge. In the book, Looking for Lydia, historians Michael Reniger and Amy Greer cite the 1923 death of Annie C. Johnson as the real life Lydia who died after a car flipped in 1920. That is a story with some history, man. Literally since the 1920s, this has been going on and there are 11 different versions of the story. A story like this isn't just made up. It's not just something that one person posted on creepypasta that became a thing. No, this has been part of the identity of North Carolina for a century. Countless people have picked up this woman and then had her disappear right before their very eyes. Car accidents have happened for people driving this woman and then getting so shocked that they spin off the road when she disappears. Lydia or Annie is a real ghost who stalks drivers along this road and especially this bridge. Although she isn't inherently evil in nature, as I said before, accidents have happened when people realize they were just driving a ghost around. I have no idea where Lydia is trying to get to, but trust me, you probably don't want to be the person to take her there. And finally, number one on this list is the Devil's Tramping Grounds. This is in reference to a very strange patch of soil in North Carolina. For decades, this circle of dirt has allowed nothing to grow on it at all whilst the area surrounding it is home to luscious wildlife. The Sun Journal says, regional legend maintains that Satan frequents the area on his nightly walks 
pacing the circle as he contemplates his nefarious deeds. Normal vegetation surrounds the circle, but only a wiry grass grows inside it, and no plant life of any kind can be found on the path itself. Visitors have also claimed to see red glowing eyes in the circle. Now, there could be any number of reasons for why nothing is growing on this patch of dirt. Simply because an area of land cannot grow wildlife doesn't automatically mean the devil himself has anything to do with it. But throw in the fact that there are two red glowing eyes there, plus a few other creepy occurrences, and we might just have something demonic afoot. Locals have reported putting objects in the center of the circle, then coming back a little while later and having those same items moved outside the circle. As if someone or something did this deliberately. The thinking is that this circle is a place used by the devil to dance or to perform rituals that we don't understand. Having things inside his circle of death doesn't make for a great dancing spot or sacrificial zone, so those things need to get moved. That's why we see the red eyes in the night and there's an overwhelming sensation of dread in the area. It's the devil doing his devilish things. A daring reporter actually decided to test this theory one evening and slept in the exact spot in a tent. He said that the entire evening he heard the distinct sounds of dancing footprints outside his tent, but couldn't spot anything when he looked out. My dude literally could have been like one foot away from the actual devil. No idea how he managed to make it through the entire Entire night, but honestly, solid respect. Either way, this guy's story is an exception, not the norm. I'd avoid this place at all costs, because if you don't, the devil might actually make you pay for it. In at number 5 we have Palmer House Hotel. This hotel is not only considered the most haunted place in Minnesota, but to some it's considered the most haunted place in America. Located in Sauk Center, the hotel has been visited by paranormal activity investigators from across the country. Recently the ghost hunter from the travel channel Ghost Adventures even investigated the hotel. A brothel that went by the name of the Sauk Center House occupied the current grounds of the Palmer Hotel, but the Sauk Center House burned down in 1900, and the Palmer was built in its place the following year. The Palmer Hotel was established in 1901 and is notorious for its permanent ghost residence. The most reported ghost in the hotel is named Lucy, who resides in room 17. Legend has it that Lucy was an adult worker that frequented the past building of the Salk Center house. Though Lucy endured a terrible accident of losing her life at the hands of one of her clients. Even though this happened in the building, the Palmer Hotel can't seem to get rid of the spirit of Lucy. The ghost of Lucy is said to dislike men by slamming the room door of male guests. Some reports her slamming the room door so hard it rattles the artwork on the wall and aggressively drops the temperature. During a recent investigation, a Chicago ghost hunting outfit allegedly recorded a temperature of negative 1 degrees Fahrenheit during their stay. Additionally, there was a couple staying at the hotel that reported a horrifying ghost encounter in room 17, where the wife woke up in the night and suddenly saw a lanky man dressed in 1920s clothing standing at the foot of the bed. Other active areas include the bar in room 22, home to a spirit named named Raymond, rumored to be Lucy's manager. One employee of the Palmer House Hotel has confessed that their favorite paranormal experience is when guests complain about how noisy the people above them are, even though they are on the top floor. The ghost encounters and paranormal activity is so frequent at the Palmer Hotel that the current owner, Kelly Freezer, didn't believe in ghosts, but this changed when she became the owner of the hotel. In at number 4 we have the Soap Factory. The Soap Factory was at its peak during the soap boom of the 1880s, though now the factory has has been left abandoned. The soap factory is one of the oldest factories in Minneapolis. While the process of making soap required lots of fats, lie in extremely hot temperatures, therefore it wasn't the most glorious or safest workplace in its day. Furthermore, the fats came from animal carcasses, thousands of them. The flow of blood and skin leaked into the great river next door in the turn of the century. The building smell of flesh made it the hot spot for stray dogs that the city paid to be rounded up and sent to the end of their life. If that's not creepy enough, there are legends regarding malpractice taking place at the factory, with animal fats from local restaurants taken to be made into soap. And there were also rumors of child labor at the factory, but whatever you choose to believe, there is no denying that the site contains negative energy. Now the basement of the abandoned factory is used for haunted tours. The tour is so scary in fact that guests have to sign a waiver and have to be 18 to go on the tour. Number 3 on this list is Cry Baby Bridge. This is definitely one of the most famous spots in the state when it comes to hauntings. This 
one specifically is the Rogue's Hollow Crybaby Bridge and has a pretty sad and scary history. There are two legends that could be true in regards to this bridge. The first one says that the mother of a newborn child had a falling out with her lover. He abandoned her and she fell into a deep depression. She responded by throwing her newborn over the bridge and then followed that by throwing herself over as well. The second legend says that two parents of a newborn child were driving down the road. They got to the bridge and on that bridge their car spun out on some black ice. The car crashed into a tree right after the bridge, killing both of the parents. The baby in the back of the car survived though, at least for a time. This road doesn't get traveled on often and it was very cold that evening. When people eventually did come upon the crash, it was too late. Ever since this incident happened, this bridge has been rightfully avoided by the locals. The horrible sound of a baby crying can be heard echoing throughout the river that it passes over. They say that standing on this bridge for too long, it's not good for your brain or your mental state. That your sanity will slowly slip away from you and any happiness and good feelings that you may have had will be sucked away down that river for good. Not a bridge that you should want to go down at all, so avoid it altogether. Number two on this list is Squire's Castle. So calling this place a castle is a bit of a stretch, because the castle was never actually built. News 5 Cleveland says, located in the North Chagrin Reservation of the Cleveland Metro Parks, this castle is a reflection of the builder Fergus B. Squires, who was a founding member of the Standard Oil Company. The actual castle was never built, so what it's standing on today was the shell of the gatekeeper's house for the estate. Legend has it that Fergus' wife, Rebecca, was very much a city girl who wanted nothing to do with nature. Stories say Rebecca was walking up the stone stairs when she became startled by something outside her window. In a panicked state, she dropped her lantern and tumbled to her death down the cold stone staircase. Ever since this tragedy happened, Rebecca's ghost has never left, haunting all of those who visit or stay at the estate and bemoaning her unfortunate fate. The thing is, that she isn't the thing that most people are scared of. It's whatever the thing was that frightened Rebecca so much that she fell to her death. Rumor has it that there could be a werewolf-like beast roaming the estate. Dark red eyes have been seen in the night at a far, and the howls of some wolf-like creature have also been reported. Is it possible that Rebecca saw this werewolf so many years ago and that's what frightened her? Maybe she isn't trying to haunt the place at all, but actually trying to scare people away from this place so the same fate doesn't happen to them. Either way, I don't recommend going. And finally, number one on this list is the Lorraine Palace Theater. You know, for once, it would be really nice to go see some theater without fearing for your life. Sadly, you aren't gonna get that at the Lorraine Palace Theater. The Atlanta Journal-Constitution writes, The Lorraine Palace Theater opened in 1928 in Lorraine, Ohio, near Cleveland. It seats just over 1,700 guests and was the first movie theater in the state to show talking pictures, according to the theater's website. Dave Hensley, a paranormal researcher and the founder of EVP mediums told the Chronicle Telegram after investigating the palace that there are so many spirits there he couldn't even count them all. We got a name from a gentleman named Ed who said that he worked at the shipyard. That's profound because the shipyard was directly behind the palace. He claimed that he was murdered, pushed downstairs, Henley said. There was a spirit who said that he died of drugs as well. And we had spirits that were killed in the 1924 tornado that hit Lorraine. That was pretty emotional, one of them said. My body flew, Henslet told the Chronicle. The theater's operation director told the newspaper most people in the area probably know about the ghosts and spirits that roam the palace's hallways. I think everybody in Lorraine County has been privy to the rumors of the unexplained activity in the Lorraine Palace Theater, Chris Pataki said. In fact, a documentary in the Haunted Theater called Ghosts of the Palace is scheduled to debut at the movie house this weekend. Pretty ballsy move right there guys, literally screening a movie about your haunted theater in said haunted theater. All of this though should make it very clear how haunted this place actually is. Literally everybody around this area knows about this spot. And whenever you're getting a full on movie made about how specifically haunted you are, then you know that you've made it as a haunted location. Even though most people make it out of this theater unscathed, that can't be said for everybody. Attacks have been reported and left people feeling very emotionally and even physically scarred. Netflix is a thing for a reason in now guys, let's use it. Number five on this list is the Carolina Inn. This inn has actually been voted one of the most haunted in America by a few different lists. 
The University of North Carolina says the Carolina Inn was built in 1924 and quickly became a popular hotel for visitors and graduates of the university. In 1948, the Carolina Inn's most long-lasting guests checked in and apparently never left. Dr. William Jacox was a fun-loving man with a witty sense of humor, had recently retired from practicing medicine, and decided to make the Carolina Inn his final home. He lived in room 252 for 17 years before his death in 1965. As shared by the Carolina Inn, guests that have stayed in Jacox's old room report being inexplicably locked out of the suite. One time, the lock was so stubborn that a workman had to use a ladder to break into the room. Visitors have also noticed strange occurrences such as messy bath mats and previously closed curtains being pulled wide open. Some have encountered the smell of freshly cut flowers despite none being in the room and felt their bodies become strangely cold for no apparent reason. This is only part of the stuff that goes down at this room as well guys. Some people have reported seeing a poorly dressed man approach them looking for an unlocked door and then if they show it to him, he runs away screaming. It's thought that this is the ghost of Dr. William Jacox. I don't know why unlocked doors scare this dude so much, but anyone who's gonna spend 17 years in this hotel is probably a bit of a weird dude. Unless you want to deal with a crazy old doctor ghost messing with you all vacation, I'd stay at a different inn. Number four on this list is the new Hanover County Library. I don't know why guys, but something about haunted libraries is just so intriguing to me. Like it just seems so mystical and mysterious I guess. This haunted library is located right in Wilmington. There is a woman that haunts this place who's believed to be a patron. Apparently she used to donate quite generously to this library and in death doesn't want to leave it behind. She's in the only ghost that walks the halls here and haunts the books. There's a male poltergeist who makes his presence quite known as well. He apparently died in a duel that happened here many years ago before this land was turned into a library. Nowadays, these two ghosts make it very hard to do any serious learning or studying considering they haunt the place so much. The woman isn't too bad, she just shows up and looks super creepy, but from my reading, she only actually punishes those who cause harm to the library or make fun of it. Those who come here to learn and to read, she leaves them be for the most part. The man, however, is certainly quite the pest. He often messes with those that come here and makes it very difficult for people to accomplish anything. I love libraries, I think that we should all go to them more often, but maybe just not this one specifically. Number three on this list is the Franklin Castle. This house is actually called the Tiedman House, but over the years and from the history it has, it's been nicknamed the Franklin Castle. News 5 Cleveland says, known as the Franklin Castle, this Victorian style stone house has been a witness to history and withstood the development of the West Side. This stone castle carries an American horror story type history along with it. The house was built between 1881 and 1883 by a German immigrant, Hans Tiedemann. At the turn of the 19th century, Franklin Boulevard was one of the most upscale residential avenues in Cleveland. Franklin Castle was sold in 1896, just one year after his wife Louise died. In the century that followed, the house saw many new owners and new uses. Rumors began to circulate around 1986 that the house house was haunted by the ghosts of Mrs. Tiedman and her daughter Emma who died before the house was even built. So this one is kind of strange because it doesn't seem like anything terrible happened to these two ladies in their death or at least nothing that I could find. Most times when a spirit haunts a place it's because they died in a fashion that was very unnatural. That wasn't the case here and yet they still haunt the castle. It's a nice home to look at from the outside but definitely not a place that you should be going into. Avoid it altogether. Number two on this list is the Gore Orphanage. Anything that is named the Gore Orphanage is bound to be haunted, and this is no exception. News 5 Cleveland says it's claimed to be one of the most haunted places in Ohio. Located in the countryside of Vermilion, a fire engulfed an old orphanage, burning dozens of people alive, according to long-told tales. For over a century, visitors to the Gore Orphanage have reported strange experiences of glowing lights, chilling cries, and apparitions. Light of Hope was the actual name of the orphanage, and was established by Johann Sprunger and his wife Katrina. They moved to the Vermilion area after their two former businesses in Indiana also caught fire. Throughout the years, children told stories of a 
neglect, and slave labor conditions. In 1909, an investigation was conducted, but because the state had no laws or regulations pertaining to orphanages, nothing could formally be done to prosecute the couple. While there's no proof that any deaths actually did occur, there's still little doubt about its reputation for being one of the most haunted areas in Ohio. So, not only did this place suffer a horrible tragedy where several people passed away during a massive blaze, but prior to that even happening, there seemed to be so many human rights violations going on. I have no idea how back in the day the state wouldn't have had any laws pertaining to orphanages, but it just shows how back then these operations and children were so neglected. Because of all this tragedy and just general sadness, we have what stands today, a horribly haunted, abandoned old orphanage. Now this is on the list of places not to go, and that's because it is actually very dangerous to do so. The ghosts here are upset, and interacting with them will be a huge strain on your mind. However, if you are feeling strong enough, then I actually do encourage you to go. The only way these spirits will finally find peace is if they finally get the attention from the public that they deserve, something that clearly this place didn't get while it was in operation. And finally, number one on this list is the Ohio State Reformatory. This is one of the most famous spots in all of Ohio. It got the public's attention when it was used as the filming location for the famous movie Shawshank Redemption. It also got the public's attention, though, when it was claimed to be one of the most haunted spots in the entire state. The Atlanta Journal-Constitution says, workers laid the cornerstone on what was known as the intermediate prison between the Boys Industrial School in Lancaster and the Ohio State Penitentiary in Columbus for nonviolent offenders on November 4th, 1886, according to the Mansfield News Journal. The building was used as an operational prison for 94 years until 1981, and during that time, there was a good deal of violence, death, and disease. It's not surprising in the least to find out that this place is haunted. Visitors have reported seeing shadows, hearing strange noises and conversations, and experiencing feelings of anger, dread, and sadness. In 1948, the reformatory's farm boss, his wife, and his daughter were kidnapped and killed by two enraged parolees outside the prison's walls. But the building itself is believed to be haunted by the ghost of Arthur Louis Glattac, the superintendent at the prison from 1935 until 1959 and his wife Helen. The warden's wife died from an accidental shooting and several years later the warden died from a heart attack according to the Preservation Society. The couple's disembodied voices have been heard in the prison's old superintendent's office. A boy is also believed to haunt the basement where he was reportedly beaten to death according to the website Mysterious Heartland. So yeah, I think it's pretty clear by all of this that this place is not the sort of spot you want to be visiting anytime soon. The amount of violence that this location would have seen is just truly abhorrent, and I'm actually surprised that they were able to get through the entire filming of the Shawshank Redemption without some serious ghostly interventions. Maybe it's because they had Morgan Freeman in the movie, and, well... Let's face it, he's kind of an angel. Number five on this list is the Trans Allegheny Lunatic Asylum. Operating from 1864 to 1994, this asylum, like most of the entries on this list, has certainly been through the ringer. This place was meant to only house 250 people at its max, but on many occasions had over 2,400 people residing here. Everyone was crammed in like animals, and considering this building was never meant to see this many patients at once, the living conditions were pretty horrible. Whenever you cram that many people into a small space together, especially an asylum, some pretty nasty things will go down as well. Several murders have taken place here over the years, along with incidents of patients and workers taking their own life. The haunting of this location was pretty progressive and didn't come on all at once. Reports date back to the early 1900s and got increasingly more frequent as time went on. Eventually it became clear by the later 1900s that this was no longer a usable space and they needed to move on. This is why it shut down in 1994 and has no medical purpose at this point. In fact, now the only thing that it has is ghost tours. The owner of this place know the legends are far stretching with this asylum and intend to make a profit on it. The ghosts are decently friendly here, or at least for the most part aren't dangerous. However, there have been a few instances where individuals have been scared to a point of serious and significant trauma. If you do plan to go here, then make sure you have a thick skin and aren't frightened easily. 
Number four on this list is Haunted Harper's Ferry. Harper's Ferry is a small town in West Virginia that honestly looks like something out of a storybook. It's comprised of roughly 119th century restored buildings. As you can imagine, it's a very quiet town and there isn't too much of a big city vibe going on here at all. This place wasn't always quiet though. In the American Civil War, this town played a pivotal role and was fought over multiple times throughout the years. People believe that it was through the death during the Civil War that this place has developed an affinity to spirits. Deborah Block says, At the nearby True Treats historic candy store, chocolate and other candies are brightly lit on tables and in baskets. The cute and welcoming shop is popular with visitors, hardly seeming like a place where a ghost would want to hang out. But store manager Tara Dockman, known as the ghost lady in town for her sensitivity to paranormal activity, says there are two ghosts who frequent the store and she even knows one of them by name. The female has a white flowy gown and she goes to the top floor of the store where there are no customers, she explained. And Colby, a man, likes to show himself and usually shows a shoulder or a pants leg which you'll see walk across a room. They both like to throw candy around and slam doors on customers. Dockman said, Colby is a troublemaker who may also push people. She assured me that she had spoken to him about not bothering me while I was in the shop and was hiding in a corner storage area. Tara isn't some nutbag who's the only one who sees ghosts here either. Tons of people in the town have had run-ins with them. In fact, the biggest attraction this town has to offer are the ghost tours that highlight how haunted this place truly is. Number three on this list is the USS Lexington. The ship has its own museum dedicated to it now and it is 100% haunted. The decommissioned World War II aircraft carrier is riddled with different phantoms. This museum is literally said to receive on average hundreds of reports of ghostly apparitions in one year. That is so much supernatural energy that is just congregated here. Now World War II was obviously an awful time and if this boat played a major role in the Battle of the Atlantic, which I imagine it did, then it assuredly saw its fair share of tragedies. The ghosts are not quiet about their presence, they make themselves very known. One of the most famous ones resides in the engine room. Apparently visitors will go there and a spirit will form explaining the engines and how they work. Then when his lecture is over, poof. He will be gone in a puff of smoke. There's also a general sailor that walks around the ship and is actually said to be rather helpful. However, with these tame ghosts, there are some troublemakers as well. Small items that you may have on your person, a wallet, a watch, a phone, a keychain, anything like that are often reported missing after people get on the ship. If you do intend to go here, then hold on to your valuables very closely and get ready for a long lecture on engines. Number two on this list is Bragg Road. For over for 100 years now, this road has been haunted by a very strange and ghostly light. It's been seen by hundreds of people during that time and nobody can explain it. Texas Highways says, in the heart of the big thicket is Hardin County and in the heart of Hardin County is the infamous Bragg Road, home to countless sightings of the ghost road light that appears to nighttime travelers on the road between Saratoga and the defunct village of Bragg Station. Before the current road was built, the Arrow Strait clearing served as Santa Fe Railroad's branch line built in 1903. From its inception, locals considered the line haunted by Mexican laborers murdered by a thieving foreman, a deserter shot by Confederate soldiers, a hunter lost forever in the woods, and a decapitated railroad brakeman searching for his head. But all the stories share a common theme, a floating orb of light. The road replaced the railroad tracks in 1934, but the light remained seen by hundreds of people over the decades. In the 1960s, Archer Fullingham, editor of the County News, spread its notoriety in articles. National Geographic published a clear photo of the light in a 1974 feature about the big thicket. Texas folklorist Francis Alberni he documented sighting stories from the old timers and young folks alike. In 1997, Hardin County designated Bragg Road as Ghost Road Scenic Drive Park. A pretty road through the woods in the daytime turns into a spooky spot for supernatural sightings by night. Word is the most auspicious times to see the light are on moonless autumn nights. What the heck is this light that has been haunting this place for all these years? Even National Geographic, a very highly reputable 
column has posted stories on it with actual photos including it. If it's a manifestation of some of these ghosts, then which ghost is causing it and maybe more importantly, is it dangerous? If you want to find out then you need to head to Bragg Road and look for yourself, but I wouldn't recommend it honestly. And finally number one on this list is the Yorktown Memorial Hospital. This hospital is definitely up there as one of the most haunted spots in Texas and could even make a play for the most haunted spots in America. It was built in the 1950s and managed by the Roman Catholic Church for a few decades before eventually closing down in 1986. Then for eight more years until 1992 it was a drug rehab facility but finally in 1992 it closed for good. Since then it's been abandoned and gained some very serious ghostly legends by the locals. One of the most famous demonic creatures that resides here is this black specter with bright glowing red eyes. It's not shy either and will attack you if you're here alone or in a vulnerable state. This is the most famous of the presences here but it isn't alone. The ghost of a man who appears to have a bullet wound directly in his forehead is also said to live here. His ghost is a lot less forceful than the dark demon though and is said to just show himself to visitors rather than attack them. The spirits of nuns are said to be on the second floor though as well. These spirits are similar to our demon creature and will claw and scratch at people who decide to come here. Along with all of this, we also get our classic indicators of a haunted location such as feelings of despair as you walk through, temperature changes, and moans echoing throughout the building. Avoid this place at all costs if you want to keep a tight grip of your sanity. Coming in at number 5 we have Goldfield, Arizona. Being deemed as one of Arizona's most haunted places Places, we have the town of Goldfield. Founded in 1893, Goldfield was a promising land for gold mining. The town grew rapidly, gaining 1,500 residents during its first year. The space was quick to build businesses including stores, a blacksmith, a butcher, a brewery and three saloons. Though the town of Goldfield met its fall just as quickly as it was built up. After five short years, the gold ran out and people began to dwindle, eventually leaving it fully abandoned, securing its ghost town status. Being classified as a ghost town doesn't necessarily mean a place is haunted by ghosts, but this is not the case for the Goldfield ghost town. There's plenty of documentation and investigations that point to Goldfield being a paranormal active ground. It is known that a mysterious figure lurks within the shadows of the Goldfield ghost town, Bordello. It is unclear who this spirit would have been in life, yet it is commonly believed he was once a miner who lived in the town. Unexplainable knocks and bangs are heard in the building and some unfortunate visitors have have been scratched. This activity is attributed to a dark character who is usually seen wearing a cowboy hat. Just on the horizon of the Goldfield ghost town sits a landscape made ominous by its name and the legend surrounding it. The superstition mountains are cloaked in mystery and at the centre of many fables making them notorious among the paranormal community. The superstition mountains carry many secrets, the most famous being the location of a supposed deposit of gold and riches in the lost Dutchman's gold mine. A curse has kept kept this treasure safe since the days of Goldfield's mining boom. Many have set out to locate these riches and many have returned empty handed or found only death. Countless adventurers have perished in the Arizona heat pursuing this chase. Their ghosts are said to now haunt the mountainside. Other secrets of the mountain have people believing that the hill is a place where evil spirits hid and told stories of a devil that lived behind the mountain. There's also a rumoured apparition of a hugely tall skeleton named the Borrego Phantom which appears to those exploring the mountain after dark. Another layer of creepiness is added to the mountain by the local legend that reptile looking people surface there after dark. All of these creepy mysteries are summed up pretty nicely in the Superstition Mountains name. In at number 4 we have Glen Rio, New Mexico. Found on the state border of Texas and New Mexico lies the town of Glen Rio. Founded in 1901 it was a town where wheat and cattle farmers settled and grew a community. Being divided between two states made for some unusual customs in Glen Rio. The mail would arrive at a train depot on the Texas side but would have to be transported to the post office on the New Mexico side. The Texas side was part of a dry county so all the bars were on the New Mexico side. Because the gasoline tax was higher in New Mexico all the service stations were on the Texas side. By 1920 Glen Rio had a hotel, a hardware store and a land office as well as several grocery stores, service stations and cafes. Though Glen Rio's permanent population never rose above 30 people, the town survived with its tourist based businesses catering to the many travellers along Route 66. By 1985 
only two residents remained in the small town and the Texas post office was the only business open. It too has long since closed. Other buildings have overgrown sites, missing windows or debris surrounding them. The detritus of four decades when Glenroe welcomed tens of thousands, fed and entertained them and sent them on their way towards Chicago or California. Number 3 on this list is Lake Shawnee Amusement Park. The park is no longer functional and based on all of the incidents that went down here, that's probably a good thing. It all started in the 1700s when a settler Mitchell Clay and the local Shawnee Native Americans fought and ended with three of Clay's children dying and lots of Shawnee warriors passing away as well. This was the inciting incident of the tragic movie that is Lake Shawnee Amusement Park. Also 200 years later in the 1920s this land was bought and turned into an amusement park. The buyer wasn't aware of this history though and didn't realize the dark mark that had been left here by that battle so many years ago. There were a decent amount of tragic incidents that went down here while the amusement park was operational, but there are two that stand out as being the most stunning. The first one involved a young girl on the swings. While she was on the swings, a delivery truck, without seeing her, backed straight into her and she passed away. The second one involved someone who drowned in the swing pool because their arm got stuck in the drain. The amusement park had seen enough and shut down in 1966. It was roughly 20 years later that they discovered the history of this place and pieced it all together, assuming that a curse must have been responsible. Locals don't dare go to this place anymore for fear of this curse. It should also be noted that the few who have stepped foot on this place again have reported run-ins with that young girl who died so many years ago. It seems that this curse won't allow her spirit to pass on and now she wanders the area. I'm sure that there are a bunch of other amusement parks in West Virginia that are a lot more fitting and functional than this. This one. Highly recommend avoiding Lake Shawnee altogether. Number two on this list is West Virginia Penitentiary. Would this really be a most haunted place list if we didn't throw a prison on here? Paranormal activity usually favors places that have seen a lot of tragedies and sadness and this penitentiary has definitely had its fair share. This prison opened up in the 1860s and was active for 119 years before finally being shut down. In that time it saw over 100 executions, countless riots where people were either so severely injured or died, fires, and an insane amount of human rights violations. All of this has led to what we have now, which is just a really haunted prison. Though the prisoners are gone, they're not forgotten, and by many accounts, the ghosts of some of the 998 men who died here still roam free. There's a shadow man that has been seen and even photographed. Staff of the prison have been accosted by unseen forces. Strange noises still echo throughout the cell blocks and something dark lurks in the bowels of the building. That was a small passage from Moundsville Haunted History who are familiar with the prison. 998 men though. That's how many different individuals are thought to potentially haunt this place. That's literally a full on ghost army right there guys. This place must have been horrible if that many people's souls are left wandering around this space. If I was the owner of this spot, I'd do those 998 people a favor and just knock this place to the ground. Maybe then these ghosts can finally rest. And finally, number one on this list is Point Pleasant. This has got to be the top spot on our list just considering the amount of lore surrounding the creature here. The Mothman. If you're watching videos on this channel, then I imagine you're already probably familiar with what this creature is, but for those who aren't, the Mothman is a humanoid creature reportedly seen in the Point Pleasant area from November 15th, 1966 to December 15th, 1967. Shayla Klein says, according to legend, Mothman is a black 10 foot creature with wings and red eyes. Articles and newspapers at the time were reporting that the monster was also commonly seen in the TNT area near town with some locals speculating that perhaps people were really seeing cranes or owls and others wondering if the creature was created in some sort of mutation accident involving the chemicals associated with storing TNT. Regardless, legend has it that mysterious men in black suits began visiting the town shortly after the sighting reports. The most infamous sighting of Mothman was on December 15th, 1967. Locals said that they saw Mothman on top of, 
or flying over the Silver Bridge, which was a suspension bridge over the Ohio River that connected Point Pleasant, West Virginia, to Galopolis, Ohio. According to Mothman lore, shortly after the creature was spotted on the bridge, the bridge collapsed, resulting in the deaths of 46 people. An investigation into the disaster found that a fracture in a suspension chain was the cause. This is one of the most famous American urban legends ever. The amount of people who saw this creature during this period of time and the fact that high ranking secret officials started to investigate it all point to its legitimacy. It was active for about a year and then just totally disappeared though and nobody knows what happened to it. The leading theory is that the government was able to capture whatever it was and probably took it to a secret base to study it. If that's the case then Point Pleasant is most likely safe now but be wary of what's flying over top of you if you do decide to go here. Number five on this list is the Plaza Theater Performing Arts Center. Built in 1930, this beautiful theater has had many shows and screenings here over the years. For 55 years, it was in operation as one of the premier spots to have your movie shown, but in 1985, the theater shut down. It remained as such for about 20 years when in 2006, it began to get renovated. Now it's mainly just for live theater and other performance art in the city of El Paso. Like a lot of beautiful old theaters though, as Time passes, legends emerge, and this one in particular certainly has its fair share. The Plaza Theater for Performance Arts Center has three primary ghostly apparitions at houses. The first is our very standard and very classic drifting woman in white. Looking sad and down on her luck, the spirit of this woman will often drift around through the rafters and has been seen by many workers throughout the years. The second is a man in all black who materializes in front of people. He's described a bit like a shadow creature, but slightly less menacing. I suppose if we have our woman in white, it's only fitting that we have a man in black to get a little bit of variety going. The third ghost sticks with the theme of spicing things up and is actually a little boy with a bouncing ball. It's not a basketball, but a small bouncy ball that the child seemingly plays with as he haunts the theater. Nobody knows the origin of these ghosts or how they got here at all. Are they connected? Maybe once a family unit who died here together or are they all separate and have each suffered strange tragedies at this location over the century? El Paso I'm sure has some other theaters and I'd stick to those ones if you're looking to watch some live shows if you're there. Number four on this list is Henley Row. Located on the Texan island of Galveston on the Gulf Coast, this is the most famous haunted spot for locals in the region. Texas Highways writes, It's not surprising that Henley Row is a hot spot for supernatural activity. Completed between 1855 and 1858 for shippers and cotton brokers, it was the town's tallest structure during the Civil War. The roof doubled as a Confederate lookout for Union ships. Galveston and nearby barrier islands, history had been laced with tragedy. It was the site of a bloody civil war fight and serial epidemics of yellow fever decimated the populace. Hurricanes blast through regularly, the 1990 storm left up to 12,000 casualties and the worst natural disaster in US history. No wonder Texas writer Brian Woolley called Galveston an old cemetery with a beach attached. The resident ghosts of Henley Row represent aspects of Galveston history. There's the confederate soldier seen on the roof and around the building. The bloodied teenage factory worker is a vestige of the building's cotton grading days. The lady in white and the running and playing little boy and little girl are thought to be 1900 storm victims. The upper floors house apartments and offices now, but Henley Market's glass ceiling reveals views of stairs and landings. During renovations, workers reported tools mysteriously moving around. Staff recall other spooky experiences as well. Some years ago, a friend gave her old photo of Dr. Wilbur from a house on Church Street that's always displayed in the shop. When Hurricane Ike inundated the building with 10 feet of water in 2008, the photo went undamaged while many other things were destroyed. Every year on November 1st, employees construct an elaborate Day of the Dead altar that includes the photo and lighted candles. Before closing, the staff follows a three-person backup routine to ensure the candles are completely extinguished, even dousing them with water. Yet almost every single year, one or more candles are burning the next morning. I can't imagine working at a place where we had to light candles for our ghost altar. Like that action alone would make me want to quit immediately. I 
suppose the one good thing is that the ghosts here don't appear to be particularly evil or wanting to inflict harm. Still though, waking up and heading to work is already a tall task as it is, but knowing that there's a dead little boy and girl waiting there? Yeah, that's a solid no-go for me. In at number three, we have Nevada City in Montana. Miners settled in Nevada City in 1963, along with establishing their homes and businesses in this new town. Located in southwestern Montana, the town is one and a half miles from Virginia City. The town was thriving up until 1876 when the gold miners moved to other promising sites. In 1896, the Connery Place and Mining Company destroyed most of the city's buildings. The company dredged the gulch and later abandoned it, leaving heavy wooden barges. This abandoned town being haunted is old news as the Nevada City Hotel is reported to be frequented by the apparition of a road agent who lost their life nearby, according to online sources. Visitors have also reported hearing footsteps in the hallways and seeing shadowy figures standing behind their reflections in mirrors. Additionally, the spirit of an older cowboy figure who never speaks but lurks in the hotel rooms and even sits at the bar in the Virginia City. Back when the hotel operated, guests also complained of a weeping woman, always in the same room, only to be told there was no guest in the room in question. In at number two, we have Custer, Idaho. The mining town of Custer was born in 1879 by gold miners looking for their next gold hotspot. Prospectors discovered gold in what would become known as the Yankee Fork area of central Idaho in 1867. The area was worked on a small scale for more than a decade before the discovery of General Custer Mine. The General Custer Mining Company closed in 1888 and the district experienced a sharp decline. In 1899, the town of Custer has five saloons, three stores, a hotel and three boarding houses, but the town never established even one church. By 1910, most of the mines in the area were closed and the Yankee Forks boom years came to an end. The combined population of Custer and the nearby Bonanza was just 66 people. The Silver Messenger reports just two families remaining in Custer in 1911 and then being fully abandoned the year following. Today, Today has been purchased by the US Forestry Service and in conjunction with the Friends of Custer Society is slowly being made into a historic site. Some original buildings have already been renovated, some are in process and many others are slated to be restored. Several buildings lost in a 1960s grass fire are due to be replaced with replicas. The Forgotten Town is a landmark for many people such as tourists and especially paranormal investigators. In the old school house is a museum containing items left behind and showcases is the town's unique history. Although interesting, you can't help but get an eerie feeling thinking about the people who once owned these items, as walking into one of these structures is like walking back in time. To think this town was once active with human energy and miners working every single day. And finally, in at number one, we have South Pass City, Wyoming. Only about 10 miles north of the Oregon Trail is the shell of a town that used to be a busy gold mining camp. Established in a small valley along the banks of Willow Creek, the town was born in 18 1867. The town was built there because gold was discovered in the Wind River Mountains. By 1868, South Pass City boasted over 250 buildings, 1,000 people, and hundreds of claims. The town was extremely busy as its half a mile long main street boasted numerous hotels, restaurants, general stores, two newspapers, doctors, a bowling alley, and dozens of saloons. The mining district continued to grow to as many as 3,000 residents. Miners looking for investors and newspapers promoting further settlement in the area exaggerated the region's amount of gold. But for South Pass City, its great success wouldn't last, and just two years after its establishment would begin to show its first signs of declining. Hitting a fall in early 1869, the town resurged briefly after outside of capital was poured into the area but would fall again as expenses and hardships to recover the gold proved too costly for most miners. By 1872, the town was only occupied by only a few hundred people. In the end, South Pass would become a permanent ghost town. By 1949, the last of the pioneer families had moved on from South Pass City and the buildings had fallen into disrepair. The grounds of the old town are known to be haunted and Highway 287 that follows the route of the Oregon Trail over South Pass, which is the reason South Pass City ever existed has had its fair share of ghost sightings. According to a local ghost story, a woman was driving home from a long day in Denver. Her friend had fallen asleep in the passenger seat. After passing through Jeffrey City, the driver spotted a dark hunched figure walking toward the road in the sagebush. About a half mile later, she saw the same figure closer to the road. She noted his pig coat as he became clearer. About a half mile later, still thinking about this man and his surprising reappearance, she reached over to wake her friend and 
request she take a turn driving. As a friend awoke, she saw the same man at the edge of the road, just crossing the white line onto the highway next to the car. Screaming, they accelerated away and compared descriptions. It was certainly the same man. Coming in at number five, we have Hotel Park Central. Located on Central Avenue in Albuquerque, you'll find Hotel Park Central. The original building was constructed in 1924 and served as a hospital. It was then purchased in the 1980s and transformed into a mental health hospital. However, in 2010, a major renovation occurred with a $21 million investment and it became the luxury hotel that we know today. The hauntings in this building date back to the time it served as a hospital. Patients would report seeing apparitions, hearing voices, seeing objects move and feeling the presence of other beings when nobody was there. As well, when it was a mental hospital, it was known by patients and workers that on the top floor on the right wing, there is a ghost of a woman that likes to watch people in the hallways. Patients also reported having their bedsheets pulled off them in the middle of the night. Patients were not the only ones to experience things that couldn't be explained though. Staff of the hospital did too. They would often have the sensation of being watched as well as hearing something whisper in their ear. The movement of objects and a general sense of heaviness throughout the buildings. Today, many guests at the hotel report similar paranormal experiences. As many guests report feeling watched in the presence of unseen beings. They have also reported hearing voices and shuffling in the stairwells. Several guests have also seen a female apparition on the third floor wing. A group of paranormal investigators were brought onto the scene of the hotel. The investigators were three team members who all experienced unexplained voices and whispering while close to the hotel. They also reported distinct coolness near their bodies and a sense of being watched. After reviewing their evidence, some of these experiences were captured on digital voice recorders. They also carried out the flashlight technique, an attempt at communication with the spirit that involves the answering of questions through the turning on and off of the flashlight. This was a success with several responses captured on video. In at number four, we have the St. James Hotel. Built in 1972 by Henry Lambert, the St. James Hotel was established. Found in Cimarron, New Mexico, the hotel is known to be one of the most haunted places in America. The St. James Hotel is said to remain host to several restless spirits. Both the owners and the hotel guests will tell you that many unexplained events haunt it. Several psychics have visited the hotel and specifically identified three spirits and many others who passed through to relive their experiences. The hotel's second floor is the most active, with stories of cold spots and the smell of cigar smoke lingering in the halls. A prior manager commented about the spirits that linger in the hotel and said, you never see them but you do feel and hear them. Another report from a former owner states that she walked into the dining room and saw a pleasant looking cowboy standing behind her in the mirror on the front of the bar. The spiritual activity of the hotel has been featured on the popular television show Unsolved Mysteries and A Current Affair. Room 18 at the hotel is kept locked because it houses the ghost of an ill-tempered Thomas James Wright who lost his life at his door just after winning the rights to the hotel in a poker game. Having been injured from behind, Wright continued into the room and slowly met the end of his life. Because of the tragic accident that happened in room 18, it is known as one of the scariest and most haunted rooms. This can be seen with one former owner who said she was pushed down while in the room and on another occasion saw a ball of angry orange light floating in the upper corner. The staff considers the room to be the most haunted and people are rarely allowed to enter this room, much less sleep in it. Rumours abound that when the room was rented, several mysterious deaths occurred there. Other unknown entities are also said to roam the hotel, creating a host of paranormal activities. Staff report that items constantly fall off walls and shelves and electrical equipment at the front desk behaves unpredictably. Others have reported cold spots throughout the historic inn, lights that seemingly turn on by themselves, feelings of being watched by unseen eyes, and cameras that cease to work inside the hotel, strangely returning to normal after leaving St. James. Coming in at number three, we have the Dauphine Orleans Hotel. What was once a bordello is now a very popular hotel and bar. Jilted lovers, recovering soldiers, mistreated women, they all have a chance to haunt this New Orleans landmark. Of all the stories, there are four that tend to come up no matter who you ask. The first is that of a lost bride, thought to be the spirit of a young woman named Millie. She was working for the bar as a courtesan when she met a dapper young man and they decided to get married. However, on the morning of the wedding, Millie's groom-to-be was shot dead in a gambling dispute. Distraught, Millie waited for days for her fiancé to show up and never took her wedding dress off. For years, she would wear the white dress around the bar, hoping that someday he would show up. Now her ghost wanders the hotel in her dress, waiting for her love. 
Another classic story is that of the dancing girl. A young teen has been seen dancing around in the ballroom. Many a drunk guest has claimed that a young girl helped them to their room, all the while dancing as if she were floating on air. There's also the tale of the rebel, a ghost dressed in a dark confederate uniform. While no battles took place in New Orleans, plenty of wounded soldiers would end up in the city for rest and recovery, and maybe a little bit of time at the bordello. This ghost has been seen pacing the outer courtyard, earning the nickname the Worried General. And of course, the bar itself, known as May's Place, is full to the brim with ghosts. Employees claim to have seen all sorts of unexplainable stuff, from glasses falling down from high shelves, to locked doors opening up on their own, to brochures swirling around around like fall leaves. If you're looking for a haunted overnight stay, the Dauphine Orleans is probably your best bet. Don't go paying any of the ghosts for services though, you probably won't get what you're expecting. Coming in at number 2, Myrtle's Plantation. Built in the late 1700s, this is considered by some to be one of America's most haunted homes. Made extra legendary by the multiple photographs taken featuring ghosts, you'd be hard pressed to find an ectoplasm enthusiast who hasn't heard of young Chloe. Chloe was a young slave punished for eavesdropping on the family. She took her revenge later on in the form of a poisoned birthday cake. It was served up to the owners of the house and within 3 hours, 3 people were dead. Apparently that wasn't enough revenge for one lifetime though, as Chloe is still said to haunt the plantation. Two different pictures have been taken with apparent ghostly qualities to them. One is a photo of the facade of the house, and if you look carefully in the corner, a ghostly visage can be seen. Another is of two tourists taking a selfie in front of a window, and Chloe can be seen peering out from in front of the curtains. While famous, some folks claim that they could be doctors. What do you think? After the Chloe incident, many later owners suffered death and murder tragedies while living at the house. Their ghosts have also been seen roaming the grounds. These days, most of the scary stuff is directly ghost related, so I don't know if it's still dangerous or just a spooky tourist attraction. Maybe the spirits like the attention they're getting from the public and would rather not kill anyone else. And finally at number one, the LaLaurie Mansion. Back in the 1830s, the LaLaurie family was extremely well to do, especially Delphine LaLaurie. She was a well respected member of society and known for throwing lavish parties. All was well and everyone had their fun until disaster struck. A fire swept through the building burning much of it to the ground. Among the rubble firefighters found the bodies of chained and tortured slaves in a hidden chamber. It appears that Delphine would perform unnecessary surgery on these poor helpless folks too. By the time all this was figured out, the LaLauries had fled the country, never to be seen again. With no way for justice to be served, the souls of the people held here remained, looking for revenge. Pretty much all future owners of the property quickly left after moving in. The ghosts haunting the walls are pretty aggressive too, with many people reporting bizarre physical assaults by forces unseen. Today, ghost hunters say that it's the most haunted house in the French Quarter. Historians dispute this, but that's not going to stop the phantom fans from traveling to the haunted mansion. Kicking us off at number 5, we have the St. Louis Cemetery number 1. The first of three Roman Catholic cemeteries in New Orleans, this is a legendary site for ghost spotting. Although you'll need a vetted tour guide to get in. Break this rule and who knows what kind of curse you'll incur. The cemetery is full of above ground tombs which some refer to as cities of the dead. These vaults are largely from the 18th and 19th centuries although some of the graves date back to early 1700s. Of course with all sorts of above ground burials, one would expect to see plenty of ghosts here. Visitors claim to see manifestations of ghosts walking around and an abundance of amateur photographers claim to have captured ghost orbs on film. Digital too. Some ghosts are more famous than others, but at the St. Louis Cemetery number one, none are as well renowned as Mary Laveau. The voodoo queen of New Orleans, Laveau made a name for herself through fortune telling, occult studies, and herbal medicines. These days, gawkers claim to see her floating through the cemetery where she's buried, wearing her signature bright colored clothing and white turban. Guests have reported being scratched, pinched, shoved, or even coming down with sudden unexplainable illnesses after seeing her ghost. For many years, followers of the occult would visit her tomb and mark it with three X's, but this led to more severe vandalism and it has been refurbished since. Laveau isn't the only ghost around the graves, but she is definitely the most well known. Just watch your back if you choose to visit and stick with the tour guide. Next up at number 4, The Hanging Jail. The gothic jail of De Ritter was built in 1915. Anything gothic has a higher chance of being haunted, it's just how architecture works. That's why the Notre Dame 
is so full of ghosts. That and the whole Cloud Frollo situation. Spirit appreciators in the know believe that the jail is haunted by two men hung for the slaying of a taxi driver. Joe Genna and Molten Brasso hired a taxi driver late one night and told him to drive. For reasons still up in the air, they killed him. Not knowing what to do with the body, the two men dumped it in the old Pickering Mill pond and ran off into the night. Maybe they drove off. I wonder if they took the cab. The body was found and traced back to the two would be on the run murderers, and such they were convicted and then hung from the third floor gallows. The interesting thing about the gallows though is that a spiral staircase circles around the noose. So there's a vertigo inducing set of stairs surrounding the ominously hanging noose. Definitely a ghost creator if I've ever seen one. In addition to this lovely feature, there's also an underground tunnel connecting the jail to the next door courthouse. That is a tunnel you would not want to find yourself in after hours. Who knows what kind of crooked necked wailing ghosts you find down there. Of course, there are plenty of people who claim to have captured photos of the ill-fated duo along with many other unlucky lawbreakers. Just remember kids, if you want to be a ghost, constantly do things that you'll regret. That way, you'll have all sorts of reasons to stick around for the afterlife. In at number 3 we have Kaimo Theatre. Built in 1927, this grand palace of a theatre certainly is a masterpiece of Pablo Deco fused with Art Deco. The creation of this beautiful southwestern style theatre was financed by a hard working wealthy entrepreneur, Orest Bacecchi, who wanted to fulfil a lifelong dream of building a grand theatre which would rival other larger than life movie palaces that were springing up around the United States. A large fire in 1963 destroyed Kaimo Theatre's iconic stage and much of the building Building, prompting the Bacecchi family to demolish it. In 1977, the same year, the theatre was listed on the National Register of Historic Places. The citizens of Albuquerque voted to purchase Kaimo Theatre at a steep discount. In return, the city of Albuquerque offered to fund the restoration of the landmark attraction. With the change of hands, local restoration experts were hired to restore Kaimo Theatre to its former glory. The hauntings of Kaimo Theatre can be traced back to a freak accident that happened in the late afternoon on August 2, 1951. Back then, hundreds Hundreds of moviegoers were in Kaimo Theatre to catch the latest films. Without warning, a water heater located in the theatre's lobby exploded, sending scalding hot steam and plaster into the air. A total of eight people were injured in the accident, including one person losing their life, Bobby Darnell. Since then, the theatre is said to be haunted by the ghost of Bobby. Performers and staff of Kaimo Theatre have all reported strange and unexplainable activities happening in the theatre. In particular, donuts placed backstage for performers would often go missing. To appease the spirit of Bobby, an altar was erected beneath the stairs to the dressing rooms. Toys, sweets and donuts would be placed before every major performance to ensure the success of each show. Those who didn't would face a disastrous performance. Kaimo Theatre's technical manager, Dennis Potter, recounted an incident in December 19. 86 when the donuts were removed by Andrew Shear, director of A Christmas Carol, just minutes before the first show. It did not take long before the disaster occurred. Electrical cables fell, lights exploded, doors on the set opened without warning, and performers had forgotten their lines. After the end of the disastrous show, the donuts were promptly replaced and the next show went off without a hiccup. However, an interview with Andrew contradicted the Potter's story, with the former claiming that the donuts were never removed or replaced. Apart from the unexplainable disruption, staff working at Kaimo Theatre have also reported seeing the ghost of Bobby, dressed in a striped shirt and blue pants. The ghost of Bobby is often seen loitering on the lobby staircase looking for the next victim of his harmless shenanigans. In at number 2 we have La Fonda Hotel. Standing in Santa Fe, New Mexico, there is the historic La Fonda Hotel. Over the years the hotel was destroyed and rebuilt several times over. In 1821 when Captain William Becknell blazed the path of what would become known as the Santa Fe Trail, he stayed at a La Fonda where the trail terminated at the town. Central Plaza. As more and more pioneers travelled the Santa Fe Trail, the La Fonda became a popular destination for trappers, traders, mountain men, soldiers, politicians, and the like. The current La Fonda was built in 1922 on the site of the previous inns. In 1925, it was acquired by the Atchison Topeka Santa Fe Railroad, which leased it to Fred Harvey. For more than 40 years, from 1926 to 1968, La Fonda was one of the famous Harvey houses, a renowned chain of fine hotels. Today, the La Fonda hotel is said to host not only travellers visiting Santa Fe but also several ghosts. Some people believe that the Honourable Judge Slough continues to walk its hallways. However, more often reported is the ghost of the distraught salesman who jumped into the well after losing
using all of his company's money. The hotel's dining room called the La Plazuela is situated directly over the old well and both guests and staff alike have reported the sight of a ghostly figure that walks to the centre of the room then seemingly jumps into the floor and disappears. Other reported phenomena include a ghost that haunts the Santa Fe room as well as the spirit that walks the hallways near the La Terraza, a restaurant located on the east side of the hotel's third floor. In the 1970s a ghost reportedly called the front desk to complain that someone was walking up and down the hallway in front of his room. When an employee was sent to investigate he saw a tall man in a long black coat disappear into a stairwell. However when he followed him to the stairs there was no sign of the mysterious visitor. And finally in at number 1 we have the Luna Mansion. The Luna Mansion in Los Lunas, New Mexico is known for one thing and it's its ghost stories. Over the years the Luna Mansion in Los Lunas has gained a reputation as being haunted. Guests and staff alike have shared stories of unexplained activity which some chalk up to the paranormal. Over the years the mansion changed hands several times before it was purchased and renovated as a fine dining establishment in the 1970s. It was then that the ghost of Josephina began to appear. Perhaps she didn't like the renovations or maybe she just wants to stick around to make sure they were doing a good job on the home that she had spent so many years looking after. Dressed in 1920s period clothing she had been described by employees as appearing very real. Most often she's seen in two former bedrooms on the second floor, an attic, storeroom and at the top of the stairs leading to the second floor bar. At the top of the stairs sits an old rocking chair which she has often been seen sitting in and rocking slowly. On one occasion when an employee approached the ghost she simply stood up and then slowly vanished. More often she is seen walking up and down the stairs, a habit that has been so commonplace that employees barely notice anymore. Where there's one spirit others seem to follow and more ghostly apparitions have been seen at the mansion. One of these is a former servant named Cruz who was thought to have been a groundskeeper. Most often seen on the main level he is said to be particularly friendly to women and children and likes to play practical jokes on the employees and patrons. On one occasion he was seen sitting on a sofa as if waiting to be served. Dressed in vintage attire the man was relaxing patiently when a waitress asked another staff member why he hadn't been served. However the response was what man and when the waitress looked back to the sofa the vintage spirit faded away. In a number 5 we have James Bay Inn in Victoria, British Columbia. The James Bay Inn opened in 1911 and is the third oldest hotel in Victoria. The hotel has continued to operate only closing briefly during the war. The hotel was built so that every room has a view outside and access to fresh air. This was the most important thing to the architects. The hotel bought enough land that there is nothing blocking guests view. In 1942 the hotel was purchased by the Mother Cecilia's religious order. From then until 1945 the hotel was run as St Mary's Priory. During this time the building had its most famous visitor, the Canadian painter Emily Carr. The Canadian painter Emily Carr was a patient at the Priory during her illness. It was here that she spent her final days and finally succumbed to her illness. Many believe that her spirit did not pass on. It could have been that she has unfinished business, a painting she had yet to finish. In the final days before she died she was made aware she was to be awarded an achievement for her life's work, an award she did not live to see. The room that was used for the sick in 1945 has since been refurbished a number of times. It is now a men's room leading off from the pub. It is believed that her spirit is unhappy that where she had her final moments has been turned into a restroom. There are reports that she likes to play around with the ghosts. She will call the phones in the rooms at night. When answered, no one is there. She has also been seen to appear at the end of the beds watching people sleep at night. She was also once seen in a mirror of the washroom. The scared guests told others but no one else saw her on investigation. In at number 4 we have Fairmont Royal York in Toronto. Opened in 1929 by Canadian Pacific Hotels, the Fairmont Royal York in Toronto has been a member of historic hotels worldwide since 2017. When it first opened the hotel was the tallest structure in the entire British Empire. Within a year the demand for the hotel grew so much the hotel already had its first renovations to add more rooms. Like most other hotels around that time the hotel was designed as a chateau and art deco style architecture. This hotel has also hosted royal family members as King George IV and Queen Elizabeth during their royal visit to Canada. The hotel is believed to have at least four ghosts who like to walk the halls of the historic hotel. An author named John Robert Colombo wrote the book Mysteries of Ontario. In the book he mentioned a ghost that he came across during his stay at the Fairmont Hotel. According to the book he saw an apparition of a man. He said he was a grey haired man in a maroon jacket. He saw the man in the hallway of the 8th floor. Others have also reported seeing the man in different areas of the hotel. There is another story about a young woman who used to work 
work at the hotel. The former employee once went missing during her shift. When she was finally found, it was too late. The woman had taken her life and was hanging from the stairwell railing above the 19th floor. The reason why she did this was never discovered. Since then, staff have heard strange scrapings and screams coming from that area of the hotel. If anyone dares to investigate the noises, they stop. Guests have also come into contact with her ghost on the 8th floor, claiming they felt the presence of someone like they were being followed. As mentioned before, there are believed to be more ghosts in the hotel. The hotel is so grand in size that hauntings have occurred randomly over many floors. One electrician claimed he often feels cold spots when working on the hotel with no reason as to why. Coming in at 3, Droop Mountain Battlefield On November 6, 1863, the Battle of Droop Mountain occurred in Pocahontas County, West Virginia during the American Civil War. Confederate forces engaged but failed to prevent Union forces under General W.W. Averill from a rendezvous with other federal troops in a joint raid on Confederate railways. Droop Mountain was one of the largest engagements in West Virginia during the war and essentially resulted in the Confederate collapse. The battlefield site is now preserved and administered by West Virginia as a state park, and the unknown Confederate dead are buried in the Confederate cemetery at Lewisburg. A wooden observation tower, hiking trails, and picnic tables mark the grounds where the Civil War soldiers fought, died, and some say still remain. Many visitors have reported sounds of galloping horses and sightings of the ghosts of headless Confederate soldiers, as well as one soldier lying asleep against a tree. Coming in at 2, Lake Shawnee Amusement Park In the late 1700s, the Clay family moved to West Virginia, which is presently known as Mercer County. The Clay family, comprised of Mitchell and his wife, settled on an 800 acre farm and raised 14 children. However, in 1783, tragedy struck while Mitchell was out hunting. A few members of the Shawnee tribe killed two of the clay children and burned another at the stake. In retaliation, Mitchell hunted down a handful of Native Americans and killed them. The land in turn became unoccupied for years, up until the early 1900s when Conley T. Snyder purchased the land and built a small amusement park on it. However, the amusement park had just as unfortunate luck as the clay family. The park featured a ferris wheel and a swing ride and was popular among locals, particularly families of coal miners who resided in the area. In the early 1950s, a young girl on the swing ride was killed when a truck delivering sodas accidentally backed into the ride, striking her. Another child also drowned in the swimming pool, which was subsequently filled in to prevent further accidents. During its operation, at least six people died at the park, which resulted in the park ultimately closing in 1966. In 1985, Gaylord White, a former employee of the park, purchased the land with plans to reopen it. It happened for a brief period, that is, before the park closed again after a 1988 archaeological dig uncovered numerous Native American artifacts, as well as human remains on the property that had been buried prior to the arrival of the Anglo European settlers. In total, 13 skeletons were uncovered, mostly of young children. Perhaps the property is cursed, or perhaps it's just a series of unfortunate events. Who knows? But one thing is for sure, it is one of the most haunted places in the entire world. And finally, coming in at number 1, the Trans-Allegheny Lunatic Asylum. The Trans-Allegheny Lunatic Asylum, also known as the Western State Hospital, was a Kirkbride psychiatric hospital that operated from 1864 to 1994 by the government. Originally built by Richard Andrews, it was constructed from 1858 to 1881 and was originally designed to hold 250 people. However, it became overcrowded in the 1950s, with the hospital housing 2004 400 patients, resulting in it being forcibly closed in 1994 due to changes in patient treatment. Following its closure, it was then purchased by Joe Jordan in 2007, and is open for tours and other events to raise money for its restorations. During tours of the facility, witnesses have reported doors slamming, shadowy figures, and even blood-curdling screams from within the building walls. The asylum has garnered such a spooky reputation, it has appeared on shows such as Ghost Stories, Ghost Hunters, Ghost Adventures, and Paranormal Lockdown. It was also featured in Bethesda's 2018 video game, Fallout 76, under the name Fort Defiance, and acted as a base for the Brotherhood of Steel, one of the game's main factions. Coming in at number 5, we have the Driscoll Hotel in Austin. The Driscoll Hotel in Austin is rumored to be alive with the ghosts of the past who reveal themselves to guests of the present. Colonel Jesse Driscoll opened the luxurious hotel in 1886. The wealthy cattle baron bought the corner lot of Brazos and 6th Street for $7,500. 
Protocol has welcomed high society events and historic political events over the years. In 1934, Lyndon Baines Johnson met his future wife, Lady Bird, at the Driscoll. He later used the hotel as his headquarters for the White House press corps. Today, guests say the hotel is haunted by Colonel Driscoll's spirit. He was known as an avid cigar smoker, and at times, guests report the smell of cigar smoke despite the fact the hotel has been smoke free for several years. They also say Colonel Driscoll has a fascination with lights. It could happen by his portrait or anywhere in the hotel. It's very likely Colonel Driscoll is checking in on his property. Among the stories of the Driscoll is the legend of Peter Lawless. He was a railroad man who lived at the Driscoll for 31 years until his death in 1917. Some say his spirit still haunts the hotel today. Guests and employees have reported seeing Lawless in hotel lobby elevators. He can often be seen walking out of the elevator, checking his railroad watch, nodding to the staff, and then disappearing. The spirit of a little girl is also said to haunt the Driscoll Hotel. In 1887, four-year-old Samantha Houston was chasing a bull when she fell to her death on the grand staircase. She was the daughter of a Texas senator. Guests have heard the unexplained laughter of a little girl and the sound of a bouncing ball in different areas of the hotel. Samantha's father paid for someone to paint her portrait shortly after her death. It now hangs on the fifth floor of the Driscoll. Some say she tries to communicate through it. People say once in a while you can catch her giving a smile and her expression will change in the painting. These mysterious happenings are why the Driscoll is known as the most haunted hotel in Texas. It attracts guests looking to encounter visitors from the other side. They are playful, mischievous, very quirky sense of humor when it comes to playing little tricks on people. Coming in at number 5 we have La Fonda on the plaza in Santa Fe, New Mexico. In the historic district of Santa Fe, New Mexico sits the historic La Fonda Hotel. This old hotel has been providing a pillow for wary travelers since 1922. The location itself has been called home to some kind of inn or fonda since Santa Fe's earliest days. When Santa Fe was founded in 1607, records show that an inn on this location was one of the first businesses established in the new settlement. According to local law, court was held in the original Adobe Hotel, as well as executions, when guilty offenders were hanged in the lobby. Over the years, the hotel was destroyed and rebuilt several times over. As more and more pioneers traveled the Santa Fe Trail, the La Fonda became a popular destination for trappers, traders, mountain men, soldiers, politicians, and the like. The gambling hall continued to be a major feature, however, providing entertainment for military officers and the occasional professional gambler. Fortunes were made and lost here, and one unfortunate person lost his life in 1857 at the end of a rope strung up in the hotel's backyard by a lynch mob. Ten years later, in 1867, the John P. Slough, Chief Justice of the Territorial Supreme Court, was fatally shot in the hotel lobby. Slough was in a dispute with Captain Rynerson, a member of the Territorial Legislature, to when he called Rynerson a liar and a thief. More than a century ago, a distraught salesman who lost his company's money in a card game leaped down a deep well that was located just outside the gambling hall of the Exchange Hotel. Most of the history of the hotel is strung together by a string of tragedies. The hotel has seen more than its fair share of violence and anger. Today, the La Fonda Hotel is said to host not only travelers visiting Santa Fe, but also several ghosts. Some people believe that Judge Slough continues to walk its hallways. However, more often reported is the ghost of the distraught salesman who jumped into the well after losing all of his company's money. The hotel's dining room, called the La Plazuela, is situated directly over the old well, and both guests and staff alike have reported the sight of a ghostly figure that walks to the center of the room, then seemingly jumps into the floor and disappears. In the 1970s, a guest reportedly called the front desk to complain that someone was walking up and down the hallway in front of his room. When an employee was sent to investigate, he saw a tall man in a long black coat disappear into a stairwell. However, when he followed him to the stairs, there was no sign of the mysterious visitor. Today, the La Fonda Hotel is a vibrant historic landmark on Santa Fe's downtown plaza, known for its award-winning architecture and decor unique artwork. Guests don't appear to be put off by the spirits that still live there, with some staying there in hopes of encountering a lost spirit. Creeping in at number 3, the Snedeker House, Southington, Connecticut. We've covered the Snedeker House multiple times in our recent run of Ed and Lorraine Warren content, but it wouldn't be a New England haunting list unless the haunting in Connecticut made it. After all, the New England Society for Psychic Research had to have its beginning somewhere. The Snedeker House was formerly a fully functioning funeral home and mortuary, where local legend describes the owners as being necrophiliacs and unleashing a rancid pit of demonic energy into the world. Heavy stuff. The Snedeker family would later move in to be closer to their son Philip, who was receiving cancer treatment at the nearby hospital. Well, of course, that's when the demonic possession began, with Philip being the first to be allegedly tainted, and then later the majority of the family falling victim to satanic deeds. Some of 
the paranormal activity witnessed is pretty prolific including documented apparitions, flying objects causing injury and the water running a thick dark red with blood. Ed and Lorraine Warren both said that it was one of their more terrifying cases and it stands as an obelisk for paranormal enthusiasts the world over. Next up at number 2, The Bloody Pit, North Adams, Massachusetts. Ah, this creepy tale just really strikes a chord with me, so listen in. Located between the town of Florida and the city of North Adams, the Hoosack Tunnel is a 5 mile railroad tunnel that passes through the Hoosack Range, an extension of Vermont's Green Mountains. Hoosack is an Algonquin word meaning place of stones and has an appropriate meaning to the tunnel's dark, bloody past. Work began in 1851 and wouldn't be completed until 1875 going nearly 20 million dollars over its budget. It was an economic disaster of a project and with disaster often comes death. During construction 193 workers lost their lives in deadly accidents leading the surviving workers to dub the tunnel the bloody pit. The deadliest of these incidents occurred on October 17, 1867 where workers were trapped in a tunnel shaft after a gas lamp had leaked and ignited, causing a naphtha explosion to collapse the area that they were working in, rain and debris and pieces of iron on top of them. 13 men were trapped 538 feet beneath the surface as the chasm began filling with deadly fumes and overspill water from a collapsed pump. After declaring that there were no survivors, rescue attempts were cut off after just a day. But it wasn't until several months later after the deadly fumes had cleared that workers made their way to the bottom of the shaft. There they found that several victims had actually survived long enough to build themselves a makeshift raft in an effort to keep themselves from drowning. They'd scratched marks into the walls, a countdown of the days that they'd survived before suffocating when they finally realised that rescue would never come. And finally at our number one spot, Lizzie Borden's house, Fall River, Massachusetts. Well this can't be a New England haunting list without mentioning the most notorious New England homestead of all time, Lizzie Borden's house and the bloody legend of the axe murders. As the rhyme goes, Lizzie Borden took an axe and gave her mother 40 wax and when she saw what she had done she gave her father 41. The case of Lizzie Borden has fascinated unsolved crime enthusiasts for well over a century and few cases have struck a chord more than the axe murders of Andrew Borden and his wife Abby. Mainly because of the macabre bloody details of the case but also because of the unexpected suspect, the quiet, respectable and demure Sunday school teacher Lizzie Borden. The entire town was in utter shock when Lizzie was accused and charged with the murder of her parents and even more perplexed when Lizzie was later found not guilty, leaving the case to crumble into the forgotten ranks of unsolved murder mystery. These days the Borden house operates as a popular bed and breakfast where fans of the haunted tale can stay overnight in the same house that harboured the bloody brutal murders. The most popular room requested is the bedroom where Lizzie allegedly murdered her stepmother. Well, whatever it takes for a good night's sleep, I guess. At number 5, Dudley Town, Cornwall, Connecticut. And what a mysterious place it is. Dudley Town, founded in the mid 1740s, was a small settlement located in Cornwall, Connecticut, and later abandoned sometime in the 1800s. It has everything you could ever ask for when it comes to a haunted New England village a vanished family, a plague of ghosts and demons, and an ancient curse that made its way to the New World. As the legend goes, the area where the town was first located was owned by a man named Thomas Griffiths, the first to settle in the region and soon after to mysteriously disappear. Then followed Gideon Dudley in 1747, the man who the town is named after and his two brothers who would become known over the years as the men who brought the curse that has allegedly plagued the region ever since, causing the small area of Dudley town to fall into ruin. According to legend the curse began in England in 1510 after an Edmund Dudley, a patriarch of the family, tried to overthrow Henry VIII but failed and was later beheaded. A curse was then placed on the family which stated that all of the Dudley descendants would be surrounded by horror and death which manifested itself over 200 years of complete misfortune until the family made their way to the new world where they all mysteriously succumbed to plague 
and famine. Take a hint, eh? And next up at number four, Emily's Bridge, Stowe, Vermont. You might be asking, a bridge can't be scary, right? But let me tell you, yes, it can indeed. Built in 1844, Goldbrook, otherwise known as Emily's Bridge, is a single lane, 50 foot long bridge where local legend believes a girl with a broken heart took her own life and since then haunts the area as an angry spectre. Sometime in the mid 1800s, Emily was supposed to meet her lover at the bridge as they planned to elope together and leave their disputed family. Families. She waited and waited, but he never showed, and Emily took her own life in a savage fit of desperation, hanging herself from the rafters with her own cloak. As local legend goes, tales of cars being mysteriously clawed as they pass the bridge are frequent, and stories of bloody scratches down the backs of crossing pedestrians are more common than you'd like to know. It's said that if you park your car on Emily's Bridge sometime between midnight and 3am, then you can hear the dragging feet of a hanging corpse scrape against against the roof of your car. I wouldn't recommend doing that though. In at number three, we have the Fairmont Chateau Laurier in Ottawa. The Fairmont Chateau was originally commissioned to be built in the early 1900s by Charles Melville Hayes. Charles was the president of the Grand Trunk Railway. He began his career with the company when he was just 17 as a clerk. He soon worked his way up the ranks within the company. It was his idea to build a transcontinental railroad within Canada from Moncton to British Columbia. He was an ambitious man but often promised more than he could actually achieve. This often led him to upsetting people and causing repercussions for his company. He was even called heartless, cruel and tyrannical by one member of the parliament. His hotel was due to open in 1912 after he returned to Canada after a short trip to London to sort out some of his business problems. The gala opening for his hotel was planned for April 25th. That's my sister's birthday. Just so you all know. He bought a ticket to travel back on the 10th of April after hearing his daughter back home was struggling with her pregnancy. He was due to arrive in New York on April 17th in order to make the gala. Unfortunately, Charles, along with his wife and staff, were on board the RMS Titanic. Charles is said to have helped the woman in his family safely get to the boats, but he himself would not make the trip. He was brought back to Canada to be laid to rest. His hotel did open after a matter of time to mourn his passing. Although he was not there when the hotel opened, it is rumored his spirit still remains within the walls. Likely his spirit felt it had some unfinished business having died so suddenly and tragically. One visitor from 2008 stated that the hotel was definitely haunted. She claimed her floor in particular was haunted and she felt incredibly scared during her visit. Taps would turn themselves on mysteriously as well as footsteps in the hallway. She did also state it would not stop her from visiting again though. Maybe the beautiful castle is worth a scare. In at number two we have the Bounce Springs Hotel in Alberta. The Fairmont Bounce Springs, formerly known as the Bounce Springs Hotel, is a historic hotel in Banff, Alberta. William Cornelius Van Horn, another founder of the railroad, had the idea to build a hotel on the land. When construction began of the railroad in this area, they stumbled across several mineral springs. Seeing the great opportunity, William commissioned a grand hotel be built at the location. Construction started and they relied heavily on chateau-esque style architecture for inspiration. After two years of construction, the Banff Springs Hotel opened its doors in 1886 quickly became known as one of the top three mountain resorts in North America. Its great reputation stands to this day. It has hosted historical figures such as King George VI and his wife Queen Elizabeth. The hotel is now open for over 130 years. A lot of guests have visited in that time and it is believed that not all of them may have left. One story that has always been told between guests is one of the ghost's bride. The story goes that her and her fiance had booked in for a lavish wedding at the hotel. They had their entire family booked into the hotel and it was looking to be a beautiful celebration of their love. On the morning of their wedding, she got into her dress and prepared herself for the big day. Unknowing to her what came next was tragic. She wanted to make an entrance into the wedding and decided to descend down one of the marble staircases. She slipped on her dress and frantically reached for something to stop her. She fell a great height to the bottom of the stairs in front of all the guests and her fiance. They watched in horror, unable to do anything. They rushed to her aid, but it was too late. She was already gone. The wedding party had to leave the hotel and attempt to move on from the tragedy, but the bride could not. Her soul was trapped inside of the hotel. It is said she now spends her days walking down the same staircase, hoping to reach the bottom and greet her loved ones, but she never will. This is a common sighting for guests of the hotel. You can feel a chill run down you if you walk those steps today. Some guests have even heard crying echoes across the marble floors, unable to see what might be causing it. Maybe one day she will find peace in the afterlife, but right now she continues to haunt the halls of the hotel. 
And finally in number one we have the Fort Gary Hotel in Winnipeg. The Fort Gary Hotel is located in downtown Winnipeg. It opened for the first time in December 11th, 1913 and once again has links to the railway. It is one of many hotels owned by Canada's Grand Railway Hotel. It has been designated as a National Historic Site of Canada due to its long history. Any hotel that has been open as long as this one is bound to have some ghosts sticking around. The most haunted room in the hotel seems to be room 202. Many years ago a woman and her husband checked into the hotel for their visit to Winnipeg. It is said that the husband had left to run an errand leaving his wife at the hotel for a short time. When he didn't return for hours the wife became worried. She then got a call from the police that he had been involved in a car accident. He did not survive the crash. Stricken with grief the woman spent many days in the room locked away. She then decided to take her own life as she could not go on without her husband. Since then the room is said to hold her angry spirit. Both staff and guests have made similar reports of seeing blood dripping from the walls. One woman claimed that during her stay in the room she was awoken twice by the feeling of someone getting into bed with her. The ghost is not only confined to the room, others have seen her in the hotel lounge, sat in a corner dressed in all black crying over her lost love. She is not the only ghost at the Fort Gary Hotel though, simply the only one who can be identified. There are also reports of a man, he has been seen at the foot of guests bed while they sleep. When they awake to confront the intruder, he disappears. One employee once entered the dining hall and saw a man sat at one of the tables. He called to the man that he would have to leave. He went to get help but when he returned the man was gone. Coming in at 5, West Virginia Penitentiary. Opened all the way back in 18 1975, the West Virginia Penitentiary in Moundsville is said to be one of the most haunted prisons in the states. The first building constructed on the site was the North Wagon Gate, which was made with hand cut sandstone. The state used prison labor during the process and work continued on this first phase up until 1876. Following completion, the prison consisted of the North Wagon Gate, North and South cell blocks, a kitchen, dining area, hospital, and chapel, as well as a four story tower connecting the two administration buildings. The prison also included space for female inmates and personal living quarters for the warden and his family. Once the prison opened it housed 251 male inmates including some who helped construct the prison where they were incarcerated. The condition of the prison worsened throughout the years and the facility was eventually ranked as one of the top 10 most violent correctional facilities. On Wednesday November 7th 1979 15 prisoners escaped from the prison, one of them being Ronald Turney Williams who was serving time for murdering Sergeant David Lilly of the Beck Police Department. He managed to steal a guard's weapon and reached the streets where he encountered 23 year old off duty state trooper Philip S. Kesner, who was driving past with his wife. Kesner attempted to take action against Williams, but he was shot in the process. The prison was home to riots, fires, and nearly 100 executions during its time in operation. To this day, visitors have reported sightings of phantom inmates and a shadow man wandering the premises, as well as unexplained voices and cold spots. You can take tours around around this haunted penitentiary and even viewed the electric chair dubbed Old Sparky. For you brave souls out there you can also do an overnight session if you dare. Coming in at 4, North Bend Rail Trail Tunnel Number 19. North Bend Rail Trail is located in Ritchie County in West Virginia and is a favourite for hikers, cyclists and horseback riders traversing the 72 mile long trail. However, proceed with caution if you wind up in the area, particularly around Tunnel Number 19, also known as the Silver Run Tunnel. History goes that on one foggy evening in 1910, an engineer spied a young woman in a flowing white dress standing on the tracks. He brought the train to a stop, but when he searched for the woman, she had vanished. He wasn't the only one to spot her either, many of his predecessors had as well. No one quite knows the origin of the woman in white, although some bones were found under a house near the tunnel. Some people say you can still spot her. Now, those who explore the tunnel are advised to bring a flashlight even during the day, with the tunnel being over 1,376 feet feet long, which is beyond sunlight's reach you have been warned. In at number 3 we have Hotel Chelsea in New York City. The Hotel Chelsea has been a formidable presence on the West 23rd street since the 1880s, taking up a large section of the block between 7th and 8th avenues. Over the past decades the hotel has become a shell of its former self, as ownership has changed hands. We've seen its legendary walls and shroud and scaffolding and long time residents leave as the building is transformed into luxury hotels. A list of notable building residents have called the Hotel Chelsea home from authors 
authors like Mark Twain, Dylan Thomas, as well as Arthur C. Clarke who wrote 2001 A Space Odyssey there. There is no other building in NYC that has been the home, the muse and the inspiration for multiple generations of artists. Opened in 1884 as an experiment by architect Philip Hubert, Hotel Chelsea was Manhattan's first cooperative building that catered to the personal and professional needs of inhabitants. It was a social experiment of sorts for a mix of the carpenters, electricians and interior designers who created the place, in addition to a handful of artists, writers and singers. From its inception, the 12 story building was a haven for creative types and it didn't take long for the walls of the common spaces, which at time included dining halls, to become decorated with canvases and murals, some of which were created by the esteemed students of the Hudson River School. But Hubert's social experiment quickly went bankrupt and belly up. In 1905, Hotel Chelsea opened its doors to the world, offering luxury accommodations on Manhattan's West 23rd Street. A few decades later, after plenty of wear and tear, management was forced to lower room prices to mirror the condition of the rooms. During its glittering peak, day to day life at Hotel Chelsea was far from glamorous. Tenants would gather to smoke and drink in the hallways of the Victorian Gothic building. Drug use was rampant, and someone was always accidentally setting something on fire. The hotel shuttered to visitors in 2011 and after a series of unsuccessful acquisitions, was ultimately purchased five years later by a trio of hoteliers. Richard Bourne and Ira Druckia of BD Hotels and Sean McPherson of Bowery Hotel and Jane Hotel. The new owners are in the midst of doing a thorough renovation of the ailing space, planned to reopen it in 2019 as a glittering luxury destination. With the hotel's long and complicated history full of every type of person, there have been spirits that have been trapped within the walls. Nancy Spungen, girlfriend of Sid Vicious of the Sex Pistols, was found stabbed on October 12, 1978. She was found on the hotel bathroom floor by the staff. She did not survive her attack. Sid was charged with her murder but died before he could be convicted. The next tragedy that is considered to be quite popular when it comes to the Hotel Chelsea is that a poet and writer named Dylan Marley's Thomas. This occurred many years earlier than Nancy's on the 9th day of November in the year 1953. In October of 1953, Mr. Thomas arrived in the state of New York and according to those around him, he had wealth and medical problems. Many claim that he had suffered from regular blackouts and even suffered from medical conditions associated with his heart. In addition to these issues, he also had to carry an inhaler because of the fact that he suffered from a respiratory condition. He became ill during his stay at the hotel. He passed away three days later from pneumonia. However, some people believe he was poisoned. Both Nancy and Dylan, along with other lesser known ghosts, are known to plague their own rooms within the hotel. Some guests have heard screaming from Nancy's bathroom when staying in the neighboring rooms or waking up suddenly in the night. Others have heard footsteps from outside the rooms along with running up and down the halls. Currently, renovations continue as of April 2021 with a plan to reopen by the end of the year. Will you visit once the hotel is reopened? Will the renovations make a difference to the hauntings? Probably not. In at number two, we have Hawthorne Hotel in Salem, Massachusetts. The Hotel Hawthorne has been one of the most cherished landmarks in Salem for a century. The hotel was a joint venture for the town looking to build their first hotel to service visitors. They decided to name the hotel after author Nathaniel Hawthorne who grew up in the town. Opening in July of 1925, the new magnificent destination offered 150 outstanding guest rooms as well as a two story lobby complete with a mezzanine and balcony. It even attracted series of illustrious guests including the likes of Betty Davis and Johnny Cash but it was the television sitcom Bewitched that brought the Hawthorne Hotel its greatest fame. In 1970, Elizabeth Montgomery, her real life husband Bill Asher and the rest of the cast and crew stayed at the Hawthorne Hotel while filming episodes for the show. The hotel was flooded with calls asking if it was the Bewitched Hotel for years after the Salem saga first aired. Bridget Bishop was one of the poor women accused and convicted of witchcraft, was said to have owned an apple orchard upon which the hotel was later built. Many guests maintain that they have encountered her very spirit within the hotel. In front of the six floors room 612, the apparition of a woman is often seen standing still. From time to time, she will wander up and down the hallway where room 612 is located. Within the room, guests have complained of the sensation that they are not alone, as if someone else is sharing the room with them. And inside room 325 of the third floor, there have been several reports of hearing an unseen baby crying, lights turning off and on, and even the water faucets turning on and off. Others have reported numerous unidentifiable sounds. One particular employee refuses to work nights ever again. During his evening shift, after cleaning a room, he went to get supplies and returned to find the room's entire configuration changed around. With the hotel being built in Salem, there is no telling just how many tortured women still roam on the land. All dying in horrific ways, their spirits have struggled to pass on and accept their fates. And lastly, in at number one, we have the Stanley Hotel in Colorado. The Rocky Mountains are home to a hotel that's widely considered one of the most haunted places in America, and it has ties to a renowned horror film. The Stanley Hotel in Colorado is said to be haunted by several different ghosts, from past owners to children and even a couple pets. Along with 
its haunted reputation, the Colonial Revival style hotel also inspired author Stephen King to write The Shining, one of his most popular novels that was adapted into a 1980 film starring Jack Nicholson. The Stanley Hotel was built by inventor Freeland Stanley, who moved out to Colorado hoping that the fresh air and plentiful sunlight would relieve his tuberculosis. When he arrived in 1903, he was weak and underweight, but after just one season, hotel staff says his health was restored. The hotel says Stanley was so overjoyed that he vowed to return each summer and ended up building the hotel to bring a level of sophistication to the region. The Stanley Hotel opened in 1909. Stanley died in 1940 at the age of 91, but his spirit is still said to roam the hotel. Specifically, staff says he's been spotted in the hotel's billiard room and bar. Stanley's wife, Flora, has also reportedly been spotted in the hotel and is known to tickle the keys of a piano. Another ghost that's been said to show up is a former housekeeper of the hotel, Elizabeth Wilson or Mrs. Wilson. Tour guides say Wilson was lighting lanterns in room 217 when she was seriously injured in an explosion. She survived the blast but passed away years later. Now it seems Wilson is a regular in room 217. Guests report items being moved, luggage being packed up and lights going off and on. It also seems Wilson is rather conservative. Guides say she's not a fan of unmarried couples. People who aren't married have reported feeling cold presence between them while in bed. On the fourth floor, guests have also reported hearing children running around, laughing and playing. Guides say that's where nannies and kids they watched would spend much of their time back in the day. Not all of the hotel's purported ghosts stand on two legs. There's a pet cemetery on the grounds that guides say is the final resting place of some of the owner's animals. Staff says the ghosts of a cat and a dog have been roaming around. Could this cemetery also be the inspiration for King's novel Pet Cemetery? It definitely seems possible. Guides end their tour in a cave system below the hotel, where staff says there's a higher than average concentration of limestone and quartz, which is believed by some to draw spirits to the property. Do you dare visit the Shining Hotel? Number five on this list is Tranquil Sanatorium in British Columbia. Tranquil Sanatorium has quite an extensive and tragic history to it, which has caused its walls to be the home to many undead spirits. A sanatorium, if you weren't familiar, is an establishment which has the sole purpose of housing those with long term illnesses and is often associated with tuberculosis. The one that we're talking about right now is no different. It was built in 1907 as a facility to treat people with tuberculosis. However, it didn't stay like this for very long. The purpose of the facility eventually changed to become an insane asylum. It acted as this mental institute for a while until finally becoming abandoned in the late 1980s. Due to its deep history with death, disease, mental illness, it's no wonder that the tranquil sanatorium is now deeply haunted. The layout of this facility screams something out of a Stephen King book. It has several buildings that are connected by poorly lit underground tunnels. The building itself looks all too eerie from the outside as well with dirty cream colored walls that have seen far better days as rot and mold slowly devour them. Visitors of this place report feeling extremely uneasy. A common note for most people that visit is the presence of orbs. Strange balls of light that flutter throughout the building and then disappear. Some people have reported seeing a ghostly apparition on the sixth floor. This ghost takes the form of a woman not older than 30. She appears to be crying and screaming. The tunnels are said to be particularly haunted. People have reported screams coming from nowhere, flashes of movement, menacing and animalistic groans that make you feel as if somebody is right behind you. Children can also be heard playing every now and again in some of the more open areas of the building. Clearly this place's dark history has impacted it greatly and just because physical humans decided to abandon it in the 80s doesn't mean that it was truly abandoned for good. Number four on this list is the Firkins House. The Firkins House is part of Fort Edmonton Park, which you guessed it, is located in Edmonton, Alberta. Fort Edmonton Park is a little tourist attraction that has buildings from 1885, 1905, and 1920 to represent the homes of the time. One of the houses is the Firkins House. This home is interesting because during my research, I couldn't find any particular evidence of wrongdoings or tragic events at this home. In fact, for the most part, it seems like a pretty normal house. People have lived there before and no harm has befell them, but it seems that after they moved out and the home was donated, that's when things started to go a little bit haywire. There are reportedly three ghosts or demons that haunt this home, each one scarier and more dangerous than the next. The first one is the ghost of a beautiful floating woman who is dressed in all white. People have said that they've spotted her in the windows of the home looking out at them or slowly drifting throughout the living room. The second one is the ghost of a little boy. The boy will appear to certain people looking extremely ill. It is currently unknown if this boy died in and around the area or what disease he is suffering from, but it is said that he resides
fights in the home with the woman in white. The third being is by far the scariest of all three. A ventriloquist dummy that will appear in the home or in the cupboards. This thing can move all by itself and talk by itself. It is very similar to the popular horror franchise Chucky and it's said by some to be seeking to harm the living. I'm not sure if the ghost of the ventriloquist has taken over this dummy or if the dummy has taken on its own persona, but I definitely do not want to go anywhere where the primary residence is a demon puppet. Coming in at number 3 we have Van Gelder Hotel. This is another hotel on our list and it's the Van Gelder Hotel which is another very old building known for paranormal activity due to the many people who have visited and even locals. The hotel was built in 1916 in downtown Seward, Alaska. It originally was built as an office building but then was converted into apartment buildings and then finally into a hotel. The hotel hasn't changed much since when it was built, just small touch ups and interior changes have been done to keep the authentic feel of this very old hotel. The most popular ghost story from this hotel is that of Fanny Guthrie Bayham, a woman who died in this hotel in the 1950s and is said to haunt room 202. She is described as a young Younger woman who has long blonde hair and wears a blue dress. Fanny is one of many ghosts that haunt the hotel, but the only one that can actually be identified. It is believed that Fanny was shot in the head by her drunk husband one night, and she still roams this hotel to this day. An eyewitness account who was staying at the hotel in 2001 remembers that one night at 1:21 a.m., she was awoken to the whole building shaking and heard someone running up and down the stairs. The guest then asks a worker at the hotel if there was just an earthquake, to which the worker told her no. The customer had actually experienced the ghost of Fanny reliving her murder. Along with Fanny there have been sightings of a lone unidentifiable man who is said to appear only as wisps and orbs, as well as sightings of two men wearing bowler hats and can be seen standing behind the front desk. And also three children can be seen running from room to room, giggling when there are no guests staying at the hotel. If I were you, I would avoid staying at this place at all costs. Wish I knew where this hotel was. I stayed at a hotel in Seward, Alaska with my family once. We had a weird situation. But it was just us. We were just the weird ones. We went fishing. We were fishing all day, getting rockfish. We're out in the waters. <laughs> and then we went back to the hotel we were staying at. And we had planned to go out for dinner, but we were like, let's just take a light nap. And we all woke up at like 2, 3 a.m. in our coats, jackets. Like, it was like, I don't, it was fing weird. Like, <laughs> Coming in at number 2 with Tonsina River Lodge. Next on this list is the Tonsina River Lodge, which is located in well Tonsino, Alaska and is part of the Copper River Valley area. The lodge is considered to be the centerpiece of Tonsina Valley. Originally named the Donaldson Roadhouse, it was built by Jim Donaldson in the 1900s and then later in 1902, Jake Nafstad and Fred A. Martin added onto the main roadhouse building and ultimately changed the name to the Tonsina Roadhouse. It would later go under another name change, the Upper Tonsina Roadhouse house and underwent some more accommodations which could house up to 60 guests. This hotel is very historic and actually was once a brothel before it had eventually become the Tonsina River Lodge. The most popular ghost in the lodge is Charlie, who had been seen by many different workers at the lodge as well as tourists staying there. There are a few different stories of what happened to Charlie, one being that he was wanted for murder in Canada and went on the run. When authorities caught up to him, he resisted arrest and was shot and died in room 18. Another account says that Charlie got rejected from his love interest and having nothing to live for, he ended up taking his own life in room 18. And to this day, he is seen wandering up and down the hallways looking for his beloved. A third version about Charlie is that during the Great Depression, Charlie was living in Seattle and not being able to find work, he boarded a ship and decided to go to Alaska, eventually making his way to Tonsina and getting a job at the roadhouse. He really enjoyed his job, but unfortunately, Charlie ended up passing away in room 18. His body was buried on a hill behind the roadhouse. People believe that Charlie was so happy with his life at the lodge, even in his afterlife, he never left. Many people who have come in contact with Charlie say that he is a very friendly and peaceful ghost and workers and tourists say they were not feared by Charlie. So if you're intrigued by Charlie and his story you can go visit Tonsina Alaska and stay in his old room. And finally coming in at number 1, Hilton Anchorage Hotel. The Hilton Anchorage Hotel is considered to be a very famous place in the United States. Located in downtown Anchorage in 1916, it was first owned by Frank Reed. Many ghosts have come to stay in this hotel since the gold rush and have never left. One ghost that frequents the hotel is the first chief of police in Anchorage, who often is seen in the night hours around the hotel. The story says that he was shot during the prohibition days with his own 
in the alleyway of the hotel, and was then dragged into the hotel to try to recover from his wounds, but would soon pass away there. Another ghost that is often seen roaming the hotel is a bride. Many visitors have seen her tall silhouette, dressed in white and dark hallways and mirrors throughout the hotel during the evening hours, as well as the ghost of a little boy roaming the halls of the hotel. Guests who have stayed at the hotel have reported frequent ghost sightings in various rooms such as 217, 215, 205 and 202. Over the many years there have been so many ghost sightings at this particular hotel that the hotel even keeps a log at the front desk of all the eerie experiences that have happened to guests and workers. The hotel has truly survived the test of time after going through the 9.2 magnitude Good Friday earthquake in 1964, which is said to be the most powerful recorded earthquake in North America and the second in all of the world. But soon after this is when the paranormal account started flooding in. Even through all the tragedy that downtown Anchorage has gone through, this hotel has stood its ground and in 2016 this hotel celebrated 100 years of business. In at number 5 we have Whispers Estate. The Whispers Estate was built around 1894 and between 1899 and 1901 is when Dr. George and Sarah White moved in. George was a successful physician and ran his practice from their home. The two adopted many orphan children and unfortunately several passed away in the house over the years. Some of the children they took in were troubled. Many of them passed away in the bedrooms and other areas of the home and even some of Dr. White's patients have been said to have also passed while in the home. Dr. White practiced in the home for over 25 years so it's probable but unknown how many over the years had passed in the home. In the early 2000s the home underwent renovations and a lot of bizarre activity began. Many claimed that lights would flicker on and off, footsteps would be heard stomping around on the second floor and as time went on the activity escalated. To this day people reserve time to come and experience all this paranormal activity and are encouraged to write down any experiences they had while in the home and these accounts are posted to the Whispers Estates official Facebook page. You can go through the page and find creepy photos people have taken that show demonic figures, ghost like creatures and even orbs. It's also pretty common for the guests to be scratched up by unseen fingernails or touched by an unseen hand. The estate earned the Whispers moniker after the numerous guests that experienced somebody whispering in their ear, somebody they couldn't see. Due to the amount of people who have passed at the home in its early days, it's like there are a number of different spirits that haunt the estate to this day. The Whispers estate is known as the fourth most haunted house in the United States, but many who have visited believe it to be the most haunted house in the entire country. In at number four we have Rhodes Hotel. The Rhodes Hotel was established in 1893 and was named after the first owners Clara and Newton Rhodes. The youngest child in the Rhodes family, Everett, passed in one of the second story bedrooms after contracting tuberculosis at 18 years old. Soon after their daughter's death, Newton unfortunately died and it's believed he had died inside of the house. After Newton's passing, Clara turned the house into a dual brothel and speakeasy. It's said that one of the ladies of the night, Sarah, still haunts her bedroom tucked behind the stairs on the second floor. After Clara's death, the family home was opened as a hotel in the late 1800s and was meant to house those flocking to East Central Indiana during the natural gas boom. It's even believed that John Dillinger and Al Capone stopped at the hotel for a stay after hitching a ride on a train to Indiana. Not only did the family pass in their home, but a preacher by the name of Lester Poor supposedly hanged himself in the attic during the time when the home was converted to a hotel. But many believe his death could have been a murder. Due to the hotel's rich history, many Many locals and visitors have experienced paranormal activity and everyone in the town knew that many spirits that passed in the building still haunt it to this day. The hotel closed its doors in 1937 and the property remained in the Rhodes family hands but sat empty for more than 30 years. The hotel and its contents were eventually auctioned off and it landed on the National Register of Historic Places and the hotel saw three owners before the Haley's took it over for restoration. The Rhodes Hotel was purchased by Clint and Linda Haley in 1995 and they heard rumors about the haunting of the hotel, but this didn't faze them. They were more worried about the work they would have to do to restore the home. The Haley's claim that they didn't encounter any paranormal activity, but many find that hard to believe. The hotel was up for sale again in 2017 when a man by the name of Couch took it over for his charity. Couch had launched the Lost Limbs Foundation four years earlier which raised funds for prosthetic limbs for children. To this day, Couch's charity has owned and run the hotel, not only had it been named among Indiana's most haunted places. But the hotel is consistently booked for private and paranormal investigations. The overnight investigation tickets can get up to $200 and this hotel attracts people from across the country. There have been many investigators that believe there is extensive activity in this old hotel and people have captured a figure like
like shadow moving across the living room curtains with the use of night vision cameras. Most commonly people hear whispers and the second floor creaking when no one is inside. Unlike the Haley's, Couch said he's seen and heard supernatural happenings in the hotel since moving onto the property in 2017. He's heard footsteps on the staircase, the property camera has turned off randomly and picked up voices before the footage flickers back on. Once while hosting an investigation, Couch said he witnessed one of many Victorian dolls left behind from a previous owner jump off of its chair. Coming in at number 3 we have the Golden North Hotel. The Skagway Golden North Hotel may look like a classic hotel located on the main street but it has seen tragedy and has the ghost to prove it. People say this place is haunted by a lady who passed away many years ago. She is bound to room 23 on the third floor but her presence can be felt in the area around the building. The locals tell the story of how this woman became bound to room 23. It's unknown in what year the story takes place but it was many years ago. The woman was visiting the hotel with her husband. They visited the area so her husband could go on a gold expedition. The expedition was over a number of days to possibly weeks and the wife was to stay at the hotel and explore the local area. The day arrived and the husband left on his expedition leaving his wife alone. Not long after the husband had left, the woman caught pneumonia. She became sicker and sicker. There was no one in the area able to help her. She had no way to get to a local doctor with no knowledge of the area. She sadly passed away in little over a week due to her illness. When her husband returned, he was heartbroken to find his wife had passed. She had been laying in their room for weeks awaiting his return. The locals were shocked to hear what happened and horrified no one had heard her cries and helped her survive her ailment. Since then she has been bound to the room. Other guests have heard sounds coming from the room which remains empty. The spirit can be heard coughing or choking. Some have said they saw her from the window of the hotel when walking around the area late at night. Some have even heard her cries for her husband. When anyone tries to investigate the room they just find it empty and cold. The cold of the room takes over you as soon as you open the door. You can feel you are in the presence of a spirit and are overcome with sadness. Coming in at number 2 we have Independence Mine. The Independence Mine, now known as the Independence Mine State Historic Park, is the site of a former gold mining operation. It is located in Palmer, Alaska. The mining history in the area dates back to at least 1897. The mining town now sits abandoned. The operations were temporarily halted in 1950 with the plan to eventually resume operations. They were never able to resume the operations. This resulted in a well preserved collection of mining equipment and buildings. Although weather has taken its toll, many of the buildings still stand today. As we know with many mines there are often accidents due to the dangerous nature of the work. Parts of the mine would often collapse. The mine is now a big tourist site as a look into the life and work of miners in 1897. The visitors have reported a lot of paranormal activity while touring the facility. Almost everyone who visits the mine sees some form of activity there. There are many apparitions that appear. They walk around the mine as if they were doing their usual day's work. Some have even seen cigar smoke coming from certain locations. You can smell and see the smoke but there are no cigars in the area that could be making the smoke. Tour guides have noted that they often have the feeling of being followed. They can feel themselves being watched each time they tour the facility. Some have even found footprints that don't belong to them or any one in their group. Although there is a lot of paranormal activity in the area, tourists still come to see the remains of the mining town. The ghosts seem to be well intended. They may merely be echoes through time of the souls who passed here. As far as we know, there have not been any visitors who have been hurt during their visit. I would still be wary of visiting here though. Finally, in at number one, we have At the White House. At the White House was built in 1902 and is now on the National Historic Register due to how long it has been standing in the community. It has had many issues since. It was built. It was originally built as a hospital, then it was used as a daycare center, and today is used as a hotel. Any building that was used as a historic hospital has seen a lot of tragic passings. When the building was used as a daycare center, there was a tragic fire. The building caught fire in the 1980s. It was fully restored following this. During the fire, the young woman who owned and ran the daycare was trapped inside. After ensuring all of the children were safe, she became trapped and unfortunately perished. Since the fire, her apparition has appeared around the home. Most guests believe her to be a kind spirit but she does bring on the feeling of dread and terror when she is in your presence. Guests at the hotel have claimed to be startled awake by the young woman standing at the foot of the bed. Once they wake up and become frightened the spirit usually disappears. Workers at the
at the hotel claim that she appears to show more interest in families with children. She reportedly had a love for looking after children and even in death she wanted to ensure their safety during their stay at the hotel. It is unknown what room she was trapped in during the tragic fire but there are numerous cold spots around the hotel. Others have heard faint screams and cries coming from certain rooms. She is hailed as a hero for saving all of the children during the fire but guests are still frightened when greeted by her ghosts in the early hours of the morning. Coming in at number 5 we have Westmark Fairbanks Hotel. Starting off with the Westmark Fairbanks Hotel located in downtown Fairbanks, Alaska, this is considered to be the finest hotel in Fairbanks. It was built by the former governor Walter Hickel in 1987 but has gone through some transformations over the years but is still considered to be a go to stay for couples, families and business professionals. Not only is it a hub for tourists to stay, it also intrigues paranormal investigators who believe this hotel is indeed haunted. According to locals around the area, they have claimed to see an apparition like figure that resembles a huge man that spends the night in room 277. He likes to make himself known by pushing the beds, poking guests in the shoulder, and even ruffling up the carpets in the room. Another ghost that is often seen at the hotel is that of a little girl who is seen roaming up and down the hallways and sometimes she is heard laughing. Also, an apparition of a male often appears in the elevator or walks around the main entrance of the hotel. Guests who have stayed at the hotel have also claimed to have seen doors opening and closing on their own. Many paranormal investigators and enthusiasts are currently exploring this so called haunted hotel. So more about their findings should come out in the near future so if you plan on exploring this haunted hotel please proceed with caution and get on the internet and share your findings to other ghost enthusiasts. Coming in at number 4 we have Gakona Lodge and Trading Post. Gakona Lodge and Trading Post is located in the Cooper River Valley in South Central Alaska and is the oldest roadhouse in operation in the whole state. So you know that it has a lot of history and stories from locals and people who have stayed at the lodge. Jim Doyle built the lodge, an ice house and a storage shed in 1904 and was named Doyle's Roadhouse. The original building still exists on the property today but are no longer in use. Before selling the lodge in 1912, there are rumors that a notorious serial killer known as the Blueberry Kid even stayed at the lodge. Between the selling of the lodge in 1912 to about 1920, the lodge went through many different owners until a Norwegian man and his wife bought it until selling it once again in 1976 to Jerry and Barbara Strang, who were among the first owners to report paranormal activity on the property. Barbara had a strange event happen when some of the kitchen workers had actually tried to contact a spirit in the lodge when the power just suddenly went out. Yes, the power did sometimes go out in the lodge because of the harsh weather, but Barbara definitely believes that this time it was in fact the work of the paranormal. Another story is about a man named John Paulson who would frequent the lodge not only as a customer but also a business partner as well. John always stayed in room number 5 and to this day people report hearing stomping coming from that particular room. John was an avid smoker and stories from people that stay at the lodge today say they can always smell tobacco coming from room 5 even though there has been a no smoking policy at the lodge for almost a decade now. If you are brave enough to visit this paranormal lodge you could even ask to stay in room 5 and maybe be able to hear the stomps and smell the tobacco. Number 3 on this list is the 5 Fisherman Restaurant. This is a restaurant in Halifax, Nova Scotia known for its exceptional oysters and also its ghostly inhabitants. The ground that this restaurant sits on wasn't always utilized for serving up fish and chips though. In fact, it has a very long history. In the early 1800s is when the building went up and for a long time it acted as the town's only school. Nothing ghoulish or demonic about that. However, at around the turn of the century the school moved and the building took on a new purpose. It became the mortuary for Halifax and made its dealings with the dead. Now not every mortuary is going to become haunted but this one had quite a lot to deal with over the years. In 1912 the unsinkable ship, the Titanic, sunk. It sunk roughly 640 kilometers off of the eastern shores of Canada and therefore the closest places to assist with the rescue was these eastern provinces. Halifax acted as the leader in these rescue processes and because of that the mortuary had an onslaught of bodies of people whom had died on the ship. Five years after that tragedy, Halifax incurred one of their own with the massive Halifax explosion. This was where a munitions ship exploded and it killed roughly 2,000 
thousand people just like that. This mortuary served as the primary designation for both of these incidents and due to the unnatural deaths here, it makes sense that some spirits have clung on. Guests and employees alike have reported seeing ghosts all over this mortuary that turned restaurant. One of the dishwashers reported running out of the restaurant when he looked up from what he was doing and was staring directly at a ghost like Spectre. The restaurant has attempted to have serious renovations done. However, I don't think that any amount of structural changes will get these spirits to rest for good. Number two on this list is the Frank Slide. Now even though the Frank Slide sounds like it could be a fun, popular dance move that takes over TikTok for a few weeks, it is far more morbid than that. On April 29th in 1903 in the mining town of Frank, which at that time was part of the Northwest Territories, but it is now a section of Alberta, there was a horrible tragedy. 110 million tons of limestone and rock came tumbling down in one of Canada's biggest landslides ever. This fell onto part of the town of Frank. Frank was located right next to Turtle Mountain, which after extensive mining had grown unstable. On April 29th, it all came crashing down and claimed the lives of 70 to 90 people. It is still to this day Canada's most deadly landslide to ever occur in history and was a horrible tragedy that can only remind us how fleeting life can be. I think the craziest part about this landslide as well is that it wasn't just miners who were killed. Their wives, their families, all of them died at the hands of the Frank Slide. The remains of these bodies were never recovered either as the damage from the slide was far too devastating. Where all of this happened is now a section of a town called Crow's Nest Pass and over a century later the ghosts of the dead still haunt the area. This place is somewhere where visitors have reported feeling very unsafe. They say that the overall feelings of uneasiness are almost too much to bear and that they have to leave. Cries howls, screams, this can all be heard late at night as you're trying to sleep. Lanterns will be seen in the night walking around at the hands of unknown apparitions. It is basically a full ghost town of people who never deserve to die in the first place, all wanting to get a second just to feel their lives again as they were so unfairly ripped away from them. Definitely one of Canada's most horrific tragedies and now home to one of its most haunted locations. Number one on this list is the Banff Springs Hotel. This hotel is located in Banff, Alberta and is truly one of the creepiest places that I've ever read about. Now first off, I want to note the hotel itself looks gorgeous on the outside. The beautiful nature it is surrounded by is stunning and the hotel gives me some serious Harry Potter Hogwarts vibes. However, when I say that this place is surrounded by nature, I really mean it. It is totally out on its own with no other buildings in sight at all. The secluded site has been around for 132 years and has housed its fair share of visitors. Some of these visitors have had some incredible stays. I mean, when you look it up online, the hotel has a 4.7 Google rating. So, I mean, it's pretty freaking good. Some of the guests, though, they never checked out. In the 1920s, a couple was set to have their wedding at this hotel. On the day of the ceremony, though, the bride, while she was walking down one of the hotel's beautiful marble staircases, tripped and fell, smacking her head on her descent and dying on the spot. This bride's spirit is one of the most notable sightings people have had when they're staying at this hotel. It's it's said that they often see a phantom in a wedding dress ascending and descending the stairs very quickly. She's also been seen in the ballroom dancing alone, potentially dreaming of the dance that she wanted so desperately to have with the husband that she never got to marry. In 1975, a longtime bellman of the Hotel Sam died there. Since then, sightings of Sam have been pretty consistent. One story details how two women lost their room key and called the front desk to go and get it. The front desk person sent someone to go and open their room for these ladies. When that person had got there though, the ladies were already in the room and said that another bellman had let them in. They described Sam to a T when they spoke about the bellman who helped them out. Instances like this have occurred time and time again at the hotel with many people believing his spirit is still working there. Finally with this hotel, you have room 873. Room 873 is rumored to be the home of a gruesome murder. One evening a family was staying there and the father for some unknown reason lost his mind murdering his family and himself. After completely refurbishing the room, the hotel put it back in service. But now people who have stayed there report hearing the screams and the cries as if they were still dying. If you have to stay at this hotel, definitely avoid room 873. Coming in at number 5, Silver Boat in Bed and Breakfast. The Silver Boat bed and breakfast is located in Juneau, which is the capital city of Alaska. The inn is more famously known for its bakery that was founded in 1898 by the original owner Gus Messerschmidt. This is the oldest bakery in Alaska and some say it is 
the best. Although people travel from far to taste the treats in the bakers, there are reports of paranormal activity in the inn above. The original owner and founder of the inn reportedly still haunts the premises. The story goes that the owner loved his bakery and inn. He spent his whole life dedicated to creating the finest bakery. From the day it was built, he spent all of his time here. He loved welcoming the customers and ensuring everyone enjoyed their stay. Inevitably, having spent all of his time at the inn, he was here when he passed away in 1938. He was so dedicated in life, it seems his soul was tethered to the place in death. Since he passed away, guests of the bakery and inn have reported a lot of paranormal activity. The most commonly reported sighting is of Gus opening his shop early in the morning. People have seen a figure matching his description walking around the halls as he once did to prepare for his day. This is not the only thing that guests have noticed. Some people have reported knocking on their bathroom door. When they go to investigate who it is, there is no one there, but they have a feeling of being watched. Many believe this is Gus checking up on the guests. He also wanted to ensure everyone staying there was happy and people believe this is a sign that he's still checking in on the guests today. Coming in at number 4, The Hotel Captain Cook The Hotel Captain Cook, located in Anchorage, is notorious for its paranormal spirit which has been nicknamed The White Lady. People often take ghost tours of the hotel, hopeful of a chance to meet this famous spirit. Although the origins of the ghost are mostly unknown, from her behaviour it appears she passed away in the woman's bathroom, or at least in the area which may have been home to something else before the hotel was built. The locals explain how she is bound to this place and is unable to pass on. She could possibly be cursed as she seems distressed about her situation. Since the hotel opened there was a lot of paranormal behaviour in the area. She would break the glass of the mirrors in the ladies bathroom or swing open the doors to scare those inside. The hotel management had to step in when one guest used the bathroom stall located at the very end of the ladies room. While in the stall she felt something fall around her neck and start to get tighter and tighter. The woman panicked and ran from the stall. As soon as she left the cubicle the sensation stopped. Since then, the bathroom has been bolted shut as to stop this from happening to anyone else. She does seem to be mostly contained to this stall, but there are still paranormal happenings. Lights turn on and off on their own. No one has been hurt since the spirit was locked away, but I would still stay far away from this hotel. Unless you're looking for an angry spirit, this is a hotel that should not be on your list of destinations to visit. Although, my parents were there and it's fine. You know, they're gooch. They're gooch gang. In at number 3 we have Avon Bridge. The Avon Bridge is known to be haunted by almost every local living in the area. It is a massive trip art railroad trestle spinning a rural road over White Lick Creek. The bridge is a fascinating landmark in Hendricks County with lots of legends and history surrounding it, some more sinister than others. There are a few historical facts about the bridge that we do know. It was built in 1906 off County Road 625, it was designed by W.M. Dunn and is still used today. Many haunted stories surround this bridge and the area surrounding it. One story claims that a mother had been walking on the tracks and fell to her death. The mother's wailing could be heard when you drive under the bridge. It's common for many locals to honk when driving under the bridge in an effort to muffle her screams. Another story is that a drunk rail worker slipped during construction and was buried alive in the wet cement. The tale is that when a train goes over the bridge, people claim to still hear his moaning. Many locals say that if you go near the bridge at night, you will hear moaning and can see a ghostly figure of a ghost or even two or three at a time. If you're travelling near the bridge on a hot summer day, you may be witness to the ghost tears streaming down the concrete. Many people don't even refer to it as the Avon Bridge. It's often called the Haunted Avon Bridge because of the number of accounts of ghost sightings and constant sounds of the moans and screams heard from the ghosts that haunt the bridge. In at number 2 we have James Allison Mansion. The James Allison Mansion was built for James Allison and it was a dream home, done in a grand design and style that exhibited James's wealth and importance. James was an important figure in the auto and plane industry, greatly helping in the development of cars and airplanes. He founded the Presto Light Company, which produced the first efficient headlight for early automobiles and was a founding partner in Carl Fisher's Indianapolis Motor Speedway. He also started Allison Engineering Company, which evolved and transformed into an aircraft engine make known today as the Allison Division of Rolls Royce. James purchased the 65 acre estate, and he and his wife Sarah built this glorious mansion, starting construction in 19. 11 and finishing in 1913. The massive home had an elevator, a billiard room, an indoor pool in the basement, a breakfast room, a library, a grand kitchen and even pumped in ice water. 15 years after the Allisons built their forever home, James then fell in love with his secretary and he divorced his wife Sarah in 1928. Only a month later James married the 
his former employee Lucille Musset. However, James contracted a fatal case of pneumonia and died shortly after marrying his second wife at the age of 56. In 1936, the estate went up for sale, and that same year it was bought by Sisters of St. Francis of Oldenburg. The former Allison home became a home for the college's library, administrative offices, classrooms, and sleeping quarters for the sisters. There have been many things seen and heard throughout the years since it became a college. There was a girl who had drowned in the pool in the basement, and James's untimely death in the home. Both people could be haunting this mansion to this day. It's said that people who pass through a sudden accident or a bout of illness, sometimes their spirits hang around, perhaps unaware that they have died or not wanting to accept their deaths. And this is the case for both the little girl and James. The entity of a little girl is often seen throughout the mansion. There are strange cries that are heard from the basement. In the attic, an object seem to move by themselves and can completely disappear. There is another entity seen and could possibly be more than one, and they like to take keys and objects and move them to odd places. The library in particular is often completely rearranged, like the books and furniture. And finally, in at number one, we have French Lick Springs Hotel. Nestled in the small resort town of French Lick sits the massive French Lick Springs Hotel. This legendary hotel was constructed in 1845 and is a crown jewel of the southern Indiana town. But there's more to this resort than meets the eye. This Indiana hotel is known to be one of the most haunted places in the state. Thomas Taggart was a mayor at the time and purchased the hotel in 1888. After purchasing the hotel, he added luxurious furnishings, marble floors, and built two championship golf courses. During this time, Taggart became the Democratic National Chairman, and the hotel became the unofficial headquarters of the Democratic National Party. In 1931, Franklin Roosevelt visited the hotel because of its Democratic standing and won the presidency a mere year later. Over the years, the hotel and the work Taggart put into it made it one of the most prominent hotels in the area and even ran the West Baden Springs Hotel out of the business. Unfortunately, in 1916, Taggart passed away, but according to local legend, his spirit has never left the building. Taggart died in 1916, but that hasn't stopped rumors of sightings of this famous hotel owner. Guests and employees frequently encounter strange and paranormal activity throughout the hotel, and they believe it is caused by Taggart himself. Many spot his ghostly figure near the service elevator and can pick up a strong scent of pipe tobacco. Others claim they witnessed his spirit riding down the hallway on a horse and making noise inside the ballroom. Some hear noises and others encounter his ghost, though usually both don't occur at the same time. Not only is Taggart's ghost living in the hotel, but there are also rumors of a former bellhop that lingers around the hotel. Many believe that he was a current employee until they saw old photos of him hanging on the wall or were told no bellhops were on duty when people had encountered him. Employees and guests say that it's pretty hard not to encounter some sort of activity when you're in the hotel, and due to the vast amount of paranormal sightings are why it's considered by many to be the most haunted place in Indiana and one of the most haunted places in all of the United States. Coming in at number 5, we have Terrace Inn. Located just north of the city of Petoskey lies the Victorian inn called Terrace Inn. The inn opened in 1911 and was known to be a luxury 38-room Victorian resort, though the perception of the Terrace Inn has since changed from a large number of scary ghost reports. It also doesn't help that there have been multiple deaths on the premise. Before this building was an inn, it was two boarding houses until they were torn down to create what we now know as Terrace Inn. During construction, two workers fell off a beam and sadly passed away. Therefore, it's rumored that their spirits may have settled in at the inn once construction was complete. That's not the only accident and ghost story that has occurred at the Terrace Inn though. As many years later, there was a woman named Abby Sweet who was staying at the inn. Abby was pregnant and unfortunately fell and lost her life. After that event occurred, her husband Edward passed away from heartbreak just a few years later. This accident occurred in room 211, which is known to have the most reports of ghost experiences and paranormal activity. That isn't the only spirit lurking in the inn though, as there is the interactive youth. A boy between the ages of 12 to 14 who has been seen inhabiting the basement. That being said, his identity and the reason for his presence are unknown. Over the decades, there have been many reports of paranormal activity at the inn. If you ask the desk clerk for the inn's ghost files, they'll hand over a thick folder with accounts from past guests and employees. Even more frightening, it seems these reports may very well be true. 
as the reports span over 25 years written by strangers with similar ghost stories. Most reports from guests and workers are of hearing sounds of footsteps and voices late at night. Additionally, doors open and close by themselves unexplainably. Some have even reported hearing the sound of a piano playing or a party being held, but when investigated the area the sounds were coming from was vacant. Plenty of paranormal investigators have spent the night at this haunted hotel, and they all agree it's crawling with paranormal activity. Lucky for the guests though, the investigators and workers all agree that the spirits aren't harmful or hold negative energy. That all being said, this historic inn remains one of our most paranormally active locations in Michigan. In at number 4 we have Sol Choi Point Lighthouse. On the shores of Lake Michigan sits Sol Choi Point Lighthouse. The lighthouse has been in operation since 1895 and it's the only active light left on the lake, but behind its walls holds the stories and spirits. Between 1902 and 1910, Joseph Willie Townsend was the lighthouse keeper who lived in the upstairs bedroom with his wife. For decades, it's been said that Captain Willie Townsend remains attached to the old structure. The captain died at the age of 63 in 1910, and his death remains a mystery. Though some believed it was cancer, as he was known to be a heavy smoker. His body was embalmed in the basement of the lighthouse. Once Mr. Townsend died, some curious individuals got inside and went into the basement, where they found pieces of an old broken up kitchen table. Once they reassembled the table, that's when the paranormal activity began. The table chairs kept getting rearranged on their own and silverware was set on the table in a specific pattern, the way the captain preferred them. There have been multiple reports of a strong smell of cigar smoke within the lighthouse. Additionally, the captain's face has been seen in the upstairs bedroom mirror on 13 different occasions. The Sol Choi Point Lighthouse is one of the Upper Peninsula Paranormal Research Society's favourite spots to investigate due to its high activity from the paranormal. They have seen the alleged shadow of Townsend move behind the curtains of the lighthouse and have also seen him appear in a mirror. Not only that, but one guest had even said that during her visit she saw a man wearing a heavy blue coat walking across the yard of the lighthouse. She waved at the man, but he just ignored her. Not thinking much of it, she went on with her day. When the guests got home and did research on the lighthouse, she realised the man she saw was the captain himself. And to this day, those who visit Sol Choi Point Lighthouse leave with stories that turn non-believers into believers of the paranormal. In at number 3 we have Hotel Josephine. The Hotel Josephine is considered by many to be the most haunted hotel in Kansas. It was built in 1890, located in the city of Holton, and is the oldest consecutive operating hotel west of the Mississippi River. The history of the hotel is rich but also very haunted. The hotel was built by A.D. Walker and was named after his daughter Josephine. When it was built she was only 4 months old and she attended the local element elementary school and graduated Kansas University. Her graduation photo is hung in the front parlour, above the antique piano, and according to the current hotel manager, Tracer Fox, her spirit is just one that is wandering the hotel. Tracer Fox has expressed his belief in the spirits when he first stayed at the hotel. He was woken up suddenly at 3.30am and his bed was moving. He figured there was an earthquake, but when nothing in the news confirmed it, he knew it was a spirit. His mother came and stayed in a room across from him and experienced the exact same thing he did with no explanation for it. They had been skeptics before these happenings, but they are both now firm believers. Other guests staying at the hotel have similar stories, as well as experiencing hearing strange sounds, laughter footsteps and seeing shadows. It has been expressed that spirits can be found on each floor. One of the most haunted rooms in the hotel is the Buffalo Room, where shadows are often seen and photographed in the mirrors around the room, as well as the Carry Nation Room. According to historical documents, a woman hanged herself in the bathroom of that room and many guests staying there have come out of the room clutching their necks and having a hard time breathing. The hotel has brought several famous guests of the years, including former US President Grover Cleveland, who stayed there in between his two terms as president, along with Carrie Nation, Robert Louis Stevenson, Charles Curtis, Kirstie Alley, John Sullivan, Sam Rabin, and Harry Langdon. Due to the amount of paranormal activity and active spirits in this hotel, the hotel hosts several paranormal and haunted events throughout the year, and many ghost hunters come to Holton to check out the more than century old hotel. It's also been featured in many television shows including Coast Tours of Kansas and Haunted Rooms America. Coming in at number 2 we have McIntyre Villa. The McIntyre Villa is one of the unusual and historic houses built in the city of Atchison. It was built in 1889 for John McIntyre, a wealthy manufacturer of harnesses and saddles. He did a great deal of business with wagon trains plying the overland trails. John McIntyre's first wife, 
Alice died in 1892. He married his second wife, Anna Conlon, a widow with three sons, and after John's death in 1902, Anna continued living in the home until her death in 1916. During her ownership, the house was home to many of her relatives, with lots of children as well. Around 1925, Anna's brother, Judge Charles J. Conlon, a prominent Atchison lawyer, and his family made the villa their home. In 1952, the McIntyre Villa was purchased by Miss Isabel Altus, a retired professional violinist and eccentric. She lacked the financial resources to be able to restore the home, and shortly before her death, she sold the home to George Gerardy in 1969, who started to rehabilitate the old estate. Many people, past and present, who have lived in and visited the home have experienced many paranormal experiences. There have been figures being seen in windows when no one is home, lights turning on and off in the tower which doesn't have electricity, a speaker getting thrown off the counter, and boxes mysteriously moving on their own. Sounds of slamming doors throughout the night, footsteps walking down the hallway on the second floor throughout the night, the feeling of being watched, drastic temperature changes, voices, the scent of a woman's perfume, and the hunt of cigarettes. The number of encounters and confirmed hauntings seen and heard around this home is crazy, and it's considered to be one of the most active paranormal homes in all of the US. The amount of activity in this home makes it a hub for investigators, mediums, psychics, and ghost hunters. They offer ghost tours of the home, and you can stay overnight to try and encounter these spirits. And finally, in at number one, we have Sally House. The Sally House is said to be the most haunted place in Kansas. This home was built in the turn of the century and is located in the city of Atchison. After being built, the home was bought by the Atchison physician who worked from his home. The front served as an office space and examination rooms, and the upstairs is where the doctor and his family lived. One day, a frantic mother arrived at the home carrying her young daughter Sally. The child had collapsed from severe abdominal pain. The doctor diagnosed appendicitis, but there was no time to delay surgery. Sally unfortunately passed away on the operating table. For years after, many believed Sally stayed to haunt the home, and the haunting grew infamous in 1993 when the house was rented to a young couple. It started when the couple's dog would growl at nothing and make even louder growls when near the upstairs nursery. Things began to take a violent turn when fires broke out in the house, and a series of sinister attacks on the husband began. The former operating area would feel extremely cold, and objects would visibly move when the young man came close. He could feel scratches on his chest and abdomen, but the ghost never attacked the wife or baby. Not only did the former residents experience the paranormal activity, but locals and other visitors of the home have experienced objects moving on their own, mysterious coldness, physical touches, video and investigative equipment that stopped working, trained guide dogs refusing to enter the nursery, and unexplained scratches or bruising on their bodies during and after their visits. Psychics have visited the home, and many have confirmed the presence of spirits in the home and have even communicated with them, and many have entered as skeptics and left believers. Due to the number of experiences in the home, it's gained a lot of media coverage from television channels including A&E, the Travel Channel, the Discovery Channel, and the Sci-Fi Channel. The home is not currently occupied, but holds many guided ghost tours for both daytime and even overnight visits for the ghost lovers and paranormal investigators. Beware though, because a waiver is required due to the potential for personal injury, but no serious injuries have been reported since the last tenant in 1993. Kicking off the list at number 5, the Landmark Inn. Located in the Upper Peninsula of Michigan, right around Lake Superior, you'll find the Landmark Inn. Yeah, nice and cute and cozy. Come on in, take your coat off, stay a while. This fancy hotel was originally built in 1930 as a luxury accommodation for wealthy business owners from all around the United States. Sounds like a good time, let's gather, let's talk, let's talk shop around candles. These business owners would visit the Landmark to check on their business interests, all that good stuff. Though for its 100 years being open to guests, the hotel has had multiple reports of, you guessed it, ghosts and paranormal activity. It's so common at the Landmark Inn that the ghost hunters and paranormal investigators, they make trips out to the hotel quite often just to check in and be like, hey, how's it going? And they put on their gadgets and they just check in on them. They can rely on them. The hotel's sixth floor is home to one of the saddest stories the hotel has ever seen. This story takes place in the 1930s when the hotel was a new, lively social and cultural center in town. The story revolves around a ship worker who fell in love with a local librarian and conducted their love affair in the lilac room. Yeah, of all places, of course. Let's go meet the lilac room. Sounds beautiful. And that was where the man was staying. Perfect place to meet. The couple was said to have a planned wedding upon his return from the last voyage on the sometimes treacherous Lake Superior. Unfortunately, their love affair ended in tragedy when his ship met with a storm and sank to the bottom of a lake. He never returned to the shore and the librarian mourned the man in said lilac room, eventually dying herself of a broken heart. The heartbreaking story comes with many reports of the lilac room now being haunted. 
Yeah, rightfully so. As a large number of guests has reported hearing cries and whispers from a female. The female is also seen by many guests and workers on the sixth floor near the lilac room, crying and mourning for her loved one. A less romantic story that is associated with the hotel goes back to when it was even finished being built. During construction, a man ended the life of his girlfriend due to anger and jealousy. And this took place right after she told him about her past boyfriends and their relationship history. Just normal stuff that he flipped out on, just a monster. And since the hotel was still being built, to conceal the evidence, the man and buried her in the unfinished basement. Just horrible stuff. You knew I was going there and you're like, ah, oh, please don't. To this day, decades later, visitors and employees report hearing cries from that basement and some report hearing whispers from a female voice asking for them to find her body. I just got goosebumps. That's real goosebumps. No matter how much time goes by, these two women, heartbroken for different reasons, still haunt said hotel today. Number four, Michigan Bell Telephone Building. The Bell Telephone Building can be found in downtown Grand Rapids. It's known from the legend that the building is haunted by two ghosts. It's always two, eh? Always gotta have pairs. Good things come in pairs, even demons. These spirits have consistently caused chaos throughout the buildings for years in their own unique personal way. We love it, we love a unique ghost. The spirits that haunt the Bell Building are rumored to be Warren and Virginia Randall, a couple who used to reside in the Grand Rapids. Back in 1907, they moved from Detroit and bought the Judd White Mansion in Grand Rapids, which has now been torn down and built into what we now know as the Bell Telephone Building. So a lot of history there already. Over the years of living in this new house, Warren and Virginia's relationship started to crumble as Warren became very strange and paranoid almost, creating hardships in their relationship. In 1908, Virginia became tired of Warren's strange and aggressive behavior, so she decided, I'm out of here, peace. She left him. One night, three years after they were separated, Warren convinced Virginia into taking a car ride with them, you know, hoping to get back together, maybe talk it out. The two of them ended up at the Judd White House where their verbal disagreement turned horrible and Warren sadly took the life of Virginia. Then he proceeded to end his own life in the very same moment. The tragic accident that happened in the Judd White House became public knowledge and the house was left empty with no one wanting to occupy it. Yeah, more than fair. I'm like, what's rent? Also, what happened? No. The house remained abandoned for 10 years after the accident until they finally just decided to tear the thing down completely. Thus, in 1924, they built the Bell Telephone Building on the ground, which still is in operation today. Yeah, they didn't tear that one down. That one's still going strong. Due to the horrifying scenes that happened on the grounds of the Bell Building, many claims that the spirits of Randall and Virginia still remain, haunting the new building. Some say the ghosts move into the new building and remain there to this day. I mean, I think that's possible. Ghosts like to move. They like to they can go through walls, they can probably relocate. Through the years of operation in the office building, visitors and employees all report being harassed by strange late night calls, which have been traced back to be coming from inside of the building itself. Yeah, inside the house, you guessed it, it's upstairs, that's so scary. Due to this and the strange eerie feelings that the employees feel while they're even working, it's safe to say Randall and Virginia may remain on the grounds, most likely, they're, they're definitely there. It sounds like they're there, they're for sure there. In at number three, we have Mackinac Island. One of Michigan's most popular tourist destinations is also one of its most haunted, Mackinac Island. The small island sits on Lake Huron, covering almost four square miles of land between the upper and lower peninsulas of Michigan. The island was originally home to indigenous settlements long before European colonization. Seeing at least two battles during the War of 1812, it has been the resting ground of many tragic deaths, making it a prime location for hauntings and paranormal activity. In a part of the island, you will find the Grand Hotel. The area first served as a missionary school but today it's known as a luxury hotel. Through investigators, there have been many reports of paranormal activity in the area, and it's known that the Grand Hotel is one of the hotspots for paranormal activity on the island. Legend has it that construction workers uncovered human remains while digging the hotel's foundation, with paranormal activity stories being recorded in the theater, outside grounds, and in its rooms. The South have also reported seeing a man in a top hat playing the bar's piano. Others see a woman in Victorian clothing who roams the halls, even getting into beds. Another paranormal hotspot is the Mission Point Resort, which was a moral realignment, a religious movement from the 1930s. The resort's popular ghost story is about a man named Harvey who died in the late 1960s. Supposedly, Harvey was dealing with a broken heart and ended his life behind the resort, not being found until six months later. Some people believe there's more to the story, that he was 
perhaps murdered. That being said, Harvey is often reported in the resort's theater, where visitors have reported being pinched or poked. With the never-ending ghost stories and paranormal reports, the island is deemed the most haunted town per capita in the United States, with 16 haunted locations per 478 people. It is safe to say that there are some paranormal activities and ghosts lurking on the grounds of the island. Coming in at number 2, we have Holly Hotel. Due to the growing number of railroad passengers passing through the area, the hotel was built in 1891. Many staff, residents and haunted historians will agree that the Holly Hotel is one of the most haunted buildings in the state of Michigan. Norman Gauthier, a professor of parapsychology who is also known as a world famous ghost hunter, investigated the hotel in 1989 and concluded that the building is indeed haunted by a great number of spirits. Throughout the years, the hotel survived two fires exactly 65 years apart. Many residents and guests of the hotel have talked about the weird feelings they got on the second floor of the hotel without us actually admitting to seeing ghosts. The inn's most famous ghost is said to be the former owner himself, Mr. Hurst. Hurst passed away in the 1920s, but many believe he just can't let go of his hotel. He is the most active ghost at the Holly Hotel and wasn't happy with the renovations that have been done to his inn. The rumor is if you see a man wearing a frock coat and top hat and smell cigars, you most likely have met the man himself. The other most common spirit would be with the former hostess, Nora Kane. According to the hotel, Nora's ghost is seen most often in the bar and back hallway. She has been heard playing the piano or softly singing a tune throughout the hotel, and her flowery perfumes can be faintly smelt when she is around. Those are only the two most common spirits of the Holly Hotel, though there are so many more encounters reported by visitors and ghost hunters. And finally, in at number one, we have Beeson Mansion. Found in Niles, Michigan, it's an old mansion that was built in 1847. The home was constructed by a local whiskey distiller who sold it to an attorney, Strother Beeson, and that's why it was referred to as the Beeson Mansion. Across the street of the mansion lies the family's private cemetery. Strother built the tomb across the street as a final resting place for his mother, and it wasn't too long afterward another family member joined the cemetery. Strother's son, born in 1969, tragically passed away, and a total of 12 family members are now entombed in the crypt. The ghost stories surrounding the Beeson Mausoleum are at least based on truth, if not completely true. Family legends about Harriet's odd behavior were cited in newspapers over time, but not until much later accompanied by reporting on unverifiable hauntings. Jumping to the late 1980s when working to restore the mansion, the property owner reported hitting their head on a table in the hall, but something hitting them on the back. As well, they experienced instances of being pushed forward by an unknown force. Additionally, the doors would open and close behind them unexplainably. The renovated mansion is vacant now, but no one dares to buy it due to the many cases of hauntings and paranormal activity. Coming in at number five, we have William A. Irvin. During the fall season, the ship has haunted tours with actors, but the ship really is haunted. The haunted ship began in Duluth in 1992. Before the haunted ship started, the William A. Irvin was open for regular boat tours during the month of October. Historically, this month was really slow, and the DECC needed a way to generate more revenue during this quiet month. Having heard about a failed attempt by Cleveland's William G. Mather trying to become a haunted ship, the DECC decided to try their own hands at a haunted attraction. The William A. Irvin partnered up with UMD to give the school's drama department some experience on production and acting. Needless to say, their attempt was a huge success. More than two decades later, the haunted ship is the peak of the Irvin's yearly business. The most common sighting that employees relate is that a lady in white has been seen walking around the ship, noticeably. She is usually up on deck and is dressed in period clothing. Nobody has ever been able to identify who she is or why she is tied to the vessel. There is also said to be a former captain who is still overseeing his ship. He is most often seen in the captain's chair and is said to be angry that the ship remains in dock and is no longer seaworthy. There are another two men haunting the ship. One sticks to the front of the ship and apparently does not understand what has happened to him, while the other sticks to the rear of the ship and has confirmed that he died after falling from a ladder. The family of the second man has come forward and said the story surrounding his death was always suspicious and they were denied a claim to his pension. In a number four, we have Enger Tower. The 82 year old watchtower can be found right in the middle of Enger Pa. The tower was built in 1939 and looks over the Duluth Harbor, being known as one of the most well known haunted places in Minnesota and for good reason. The tower is 531 feet above Lake Superior and is built of bluestone from local sources. Enger Tower was first dedicated by Crown Prince Olaf and Crown Princess Martha of Norway on June 
June 15th. It was built as a tribute to businessman Bert Enger, who passed away in 1931. The dedication was in honour of Bert Enger, a native of Norway who came to this country and became a successful furniture dealer. At the time of his death, Mr Enger donated two thirds of his estate to the city of Duluth. This included the land known as Enger Hill, which along with Enger Tower is also the home of Enger Park and Enger Golf Course. The tower can be seen almost anywhere throughout the city and has since been restored. There is a local legend that a man took his own life in 1948 by jumping off the fifth level of Enger Tower. They say his body has been found hours later but was never identified. That being said, there are numerous ghost stories of visitors seeing a man on the fifth floor of the tower before entering, but when they reach the top, he is gone. Number three, the Henderson Castle. Established in 1895, this castle is a hub for many spirits and paranormal activity. I mean, it's a castle. The original owners, Frank and Mary Henderson, are said to haunt the castle as they passed away back in 1899. Yeah, I wouldn't want to leave either, living or dead. Additionally, other spirits are said to reside in the castle, a young girl and a dog. Yeah, a dog, we've got a dog ghost. How do you deal with that? Ghost barks? That'd be so scary. In 2005, the castle was occupied by Peter Livingstone McNellis and his family. When the family resided in the castle, Livingstone's son, Vincent, before anyone else had ever reported anything strange happening in the house, he said that he saw an apparition of a figure in the Victorian room. Originally, the changing room for one Mary Henderson. The son said while pointing at a picture of a woman dressed in an old period clothing, some Victorian clothing, that that was the woman he saw wearing that same clothing. I would throw up. If someone ever said that, I'd be like, oh, this is Victorian painting? And one former innkeeper who stayed at the castle each night told Livingstone on numerous occasions that she also felt a presence coming up and down the staircase. A movement passing her on the stairs when she would walk by. Ugh, these are scary. Top five is like, you know, or top 10 is scary fish. This is, this is hard. This is some scary stuff. 9 a.m. I'm already getting spooked. Well, now the castle is being used for a bed and breakfast. Guests have fallen victim to ghosts as well. Yeah, it's not over yet. The Henderson Castle is a very paranormal active ground that many ghost hunters have investigated and they've confirmed, in fact, that it's haunted by spirits. I trust them. The people that can go into these castles and physically do this, I'm like, yep, yeah, I trust your opinion, whatever. He just comes out, he's like, haunted. I'm like, thanks, Daryl. This has been confirmed as these ghosts have interacted with many paranormal investigator teams in addition to guests and employees of the castle. Yeah, they just harassing everyone. The ghosts seem to be friendly, not evil whatsoever, so that's a good side, I guess, to being uh, haunted by ghosts. They have been known to speak and physically touch guests and employees. Just, they touch them on their back, side, shoulder. Always in the back, you never see it coming. It's always in, always in this region. Not only that, but there's also been reports of radios making weird noises or turning on by themselves, even though they're either unplugged or just either turned off. Both bad, both scary. Guests and employees have also reported hearing footsteps upstairs, slamming doors from unexplainable sources, and some ghosts have been wearing the clothes that they wore while they were alive. Clothes that they wore while they died in, probably. As the spirit of Mary Henderson has been reported as many guests at the top of the staircase, wearing her usual getup. Imagine being like a clown, like a jester, and then you die in that, and that's what you look like as a ghost. You're like, what? I was doing a mascot gig. I don't look like a shark forever. Number two, Elegant Hodge. The old Elegant Elk Lodge was built in 1909. It was used as a psychiatric and TB hospital until its closure in 1948. The lodge was a former hospital that was frequented by mobster Al Capone and one that many say is haunted by at least seven different ghosts. Yeah, you thought, you thought two was bad. Add five more, now we got seven ghosts. And it's currently on the auction block in Allegan. If you have a lot of money and bravery, there you go. While the structure was originally built by physician John Robinson in 1909, somewhere in the 1920s, it was sold to a doctor from the Chicago area who had allegedly had underworld ties. That's a great doctor. You got just who you want working on your pancreas. Brought pancreas back today. The facility was supposedly frequented by mafia figures such as Al Capone, the Prohibition era Chicago mob boss, and his men. Yeah, well, they needed medical attention or when they simply needed to get away from Chicago, this is where they'd go. The, the old Elks Lodge, Al Capone. He's like, oh, it's cozy. They have great soup. <laughs> Years later, it was used as an Eagles Lodge and an Elks Lodge. And in 2010, it was acquired by an elegant woman who began renovating the property, but now she wants to sell it. Yeah, can't imagine why. Because one of the former doctors who owns the lodge had underworld ties, maybe? Something like that? I don't know. It led to a lot of people believing that there's a lot of undercover stuff about this lodge. It's still happening to this day. I don't know why I'm doing this, like it's like over there, but I'm like, there's something going on in that lodge. Especially as it's known to hold seven different paranormal entities, like I mentioned previously. For many years, employees and visitors have told stories of spirits who relentlessly roam the building. Some of the paranormal activity that has been experienced here includes cabinets opening up by themselves in the kitchen, sounds of children laughing, it's always calming in the morning, photographic anomalies captured throughout the building, and like you name it, shadowy figures in the basement, all bad. Notably where the morgue was located, the basement, good stuff, a lot of, 
lot of stuff happening in there. They'd be knocking on the front door, indiscernible conversations, and ringing at the doorbell when no one was present. Yeah, good stuff. Again, I have, uh, I have goosebumps, they're back. Guests also heard footsteps and the sound of hospital activity long after being used as one. They'd also see full-bodied apparitions of, uh, of children. They would just see ghost children. That would be it. I wouldn't have to see any more. I would just see the ghost children and be like, Again, see ya. Like that's. And finally, number one, point O Barks Lighthouse. There are plenty of lighthouses in Michigan, and plenty of them are rumored to be haunted, of course, because they're lighthouses and they're creepy, as they normally are. And this one is no exception. Built in 1847, real old, real a lot of history with this one. The lighthouse is located on point O Barks. As the legend goes, early to mid 1800s, Peter Shook had been point O Barks' first lighthouse keeper. He was the OG. In 1849, Peter drowned while he and a couple of friends were sailing to Port Huron to pick up supplies for the lighthouse. He left behind eight kids and his wife, Catherine, and she took over at that point for Peter's duties, thus becoming Michigan's first female lighthouse keeper. Since then, people have claimed to see the spirit of Catherine walking along the edge of a cliff dressed in mourning clothes as she is still heartbroken by the loss of her lover, of course. As we talked about earlier, ghosts like to wear the things that they were, you know, that they passed away in. Again, would hate to be a clown outfit, that would suck. She had also been spotted in the window of the second floor wearing an apron, along with an apparition being seen, footsteps ascending and descending, the tower stairs, and giggling has also been heard. Yeah, you hear giggling and there's cold spots, therefore haunted, for sure haunted. And the smell of burnt tobacco has also been whopping through the air many a times. Lighthouses are pretty stressful, more than fair. When paranormal investigators, specifically the Southeast Michigan Paranormal Society team, when they had a two-day intensive investigation after their search, they concluded that they believe that there's every reason for the lighthouse to be haunted. The investigators did some electric voice phenomenon work in the living room, and then they heard loud thuds from overheard. Like, where do they get this gear from, you know? Like, I, I want this gear. I have some questions of myself going on in the apartment. I want to swing it around a bit. A sound of something scraping along the floor as well, and additionally, during their investigation, the rocking chair had moved two feet and was still moving. Just love to keep rocking around. We love that. We love haunted rocking chairs. We love unexplainable forces. While they were upstairs, they also reported hearing heavy footsteps from another unknown source. So, many ghosts, there's rocking chairs, people moving around, working in the basement. It doesn't sound like the afterlife is a peaceful one, if I'm being honest. Sounds like there's a lot of to do after you die. I'm not really looking forward to it. I thought I could just kind of float around in your paintings, but now it sounds like I'm gonna have to go and wear this. Wear my morning clothes, who knows? In at number five, we have Eldridge Hotel. The Eldridge Hotel is a historic building located in downtown Lawrence, Kansas. The building is named after Shayla Eldridge, who was a prominent anti-slavery individual who lived here in the 1800s. The building became an apartment complex in the 1970s, but there was a strong desire by the city to see it open as a hotel, and a group of investors contributed, as well as the city of Lawrence, into industrial revenue bonds to make this dream a reality. In the later 1980s, it opened as a hotel. A popular story has circulated about the hauntings in this hotel, with the locals, employees, and guests that the ghost is that of Shayla Eldridge, who haunts the halls to this day. Many claim that because the Eldridge house's original cornerstone is located in room 506, and his spirit will manifest in that room and also roam around the building. People who have stayed in this room have claimed to witness breath marks on recently cleaned mirrors, doors opening and shutting on their own, and lights turning on and off by themselves. Others claim that the hotel's elevator is also haunted by a different spirit, who is known to open and shut the elevator doors on the fifth floor. The fifth floor is said to contain a portal to the spirit world. A popular photograph was taken during the 1980s that clearly shows a ghost-like figure in the building's elevator. Many other photographers have mentioned having unexplained technical difficulties with their cameras when near the elevator. The story of the hotel and the hauntings of Eldridge was the inspiration for the movie The Demon Shadow and the hotel was featured in the series My Ghost Story and has been depicted in many writings. Many believe the rich history has resulted in the amount of paranormal activity. In at number four, Midland Railroad Hotel. The Midland Railroad Hotel is known for serving the largest steak around, and if you can finish all of it, you get it for free. But it has a sinister, haunting history. It was first a popular train stop in the 1890s, then known for being the location for the movie Paper Moon, where many scenes were filmed at this hotel in 1970. Since then, it's gone through fires, the Great Depression, and plenty of renovations. It is now owned by the Wilson Foundation, has been back in business since 2003, and is listed on the National Register of Historic Places. Not only is this hotel known for these interesting things, it's most known now for the paranormal activity that lurks around the hotel. The most famous ghost is that of an orphan girl that haunts the third floor, who knocks on doors, runs through the hallways, and even jumps on your bed, leaving little footprints. A ghost hunting 
hunting team has experienced this spirit and have recorded sounds of the little girl. Another third floor room is where a sheriff was said to have been lynched and sometimes the door is unable to be unlocked even by the master key. Ghostly figures have been seen at the top of the stairs and things in the kitchen have flown distances suddenly without being touched by anyone. There are also many ghostly figures that are seen on the staircases and have left many to believe that the fire that took many lives back in 1902 are the results of some of these paranormal presences. The owner of the Midland Railroad Hotel, Melinda Merrill, says that there's not one employee who hasn't seen or felt something and you can definitely feel a presence when you enter the hotel. Coming in at number 3 we have Van Dusen Mansion. In 1892, great in 1892, Grain Baron George Van Dusen built a monumental mansion for his family. With 12,000 square feet, 10 fireplaces, a turret, and a $45,000 price tag, the home was a symbol of turn of the century prosperity. After two generations of Van Dusen's moved out in 1937, the building had been used to house almost everything except a family since, being used as a school, training medical facility, and even a college throughout the years. It was vacant in the late 1930s and spent 20 years as the college of commerce. It was home to Hamline University Law School, then the Horse International Education Center. In the late 1980s the castle fell on hard times and became little more than a flop house. By the early 90s it was headed for the wrecking ball. Two weeks before it was scheduled to be demolished it was rescued by Wisconsin entrepreneur Bob Poling, who bought it for $237,000. Now a venue to hold fairy tale esque weddings, the Van Dusen Mansion has had its fair share of past lives. In at number 2 we have Mounds Theatre. The renovated theatre and 86 year old movie house can be found in Minnesota. The old theatres have been rumoured for the past several years to be a home of community of creepy ghosts. One story goes as the Mounds was built in 1922 and operated as a movie house until 1967. When it closed so abruptly that when volunteers arrived many years later to renovate the place they found popcorn on the floor. The subject of paranormal TV shows and professional ghost hunting investigations, the theatre is allegedly haunted by a trio of ghosts, a happy little girl who bounces a ball on stage, a cursed old man that who lurks in the shadowy corners of the projection booth, and a crestfallen usher who walks up and down the aisles in search of his lost love. The ghosts in the theatres are so active that the owner had a party of four ghostbusters in a projection room sit in one dark and stormy October night. The dim light was extinguished and the room grew chilled. The owner stated that as the four sat silently awaiting their fate, shivering in the dark, and all at once there was the sound of a man crying. When investigating the sounds of the crying man, they found a shadow figure in the corner of the room. The figure reported having black glittering eyes and an aura of anger. Because of the odd ghost encounter and negative energy, they had to abruptly end the ghost investigation before it was too late. Another former owner who reopened the theatre in 2001 claims that the spirits of the theatre have gone physical and grabbed them while they were working late at night. Some paranormal investigators have left with claw marks on their backs, but the scariest ghost of them all is considered the young girl. This is the theatre's most notorious ghost and is seen in a pink dress often bouncing a ball on the stage. And finally in at number 1 we have Anoka State Hospital. Located in Anoka town is the Anoka State Hospital which is arguably the most haunted place in Minnesota. The Anoka Hospital was the first state asylum for individuals that were deemed insane. The building was established in 1898 and opened in 1900 to admit patients from other state asylums that had become too crowded. The first 100 patients were males from St. Peter's State Hospital and were considered to be chronic incurables. Men who had lost their minds due to heredity, causes or environment. In 1906, 115 women were also transferred to the asylum from St. Peter's State Hospital. Residents were not to receive any type of treatment at this asylum, as this was the final stop for them until they passed away. And passed they did. A total of 86 of the original patients were buried in numbered graves in the asylum cemetery. The original name of the institution was Anoka State Asylum, but in an attempt to soften the image, they changed its name in 1937 to the Anoka State Hospital. Although the name was kinder and gentler, treatment at the facility was not. Patients were subjected to medical experiments and suffered both mental and physical harm. The original hospital complex closed in 1999 and residents were transferred to a new facility located close by. The buildings and property were then given to Anoka County to use for offices and to house the county workhouse. The remainder of the buildings were closed and boarded up. With such a terrifying past it is no wonder that the Anoka State Hospital has been rumoured to house the spirits of past patients. 
Former employees have reported that while unusual occurrences happen throughout the buildings, the most paranormal activities are linked to the tunnels located below the buildings. These tunnels were used as a way of transferring patients from one building to another without risking escape. Ironically, many patients believe these tunnels would lead them to freedom and so they tried to escape by going down into them, but after a few twists and turns, escapees realized that the tunnels were more of a maze than an escape route. Without an understanding of where each tunnel went and how they joined together, it was easy to get hopelessly lost in them. Several escapees became so disorientated and distraught that they took the only way out that they felt was left to them and ended their lives. For years, employees would report hearing footsteps trudging through the tunnels, stopping, pausing. There was also reports of whispering and low voices in conversation, but the words were not understood. The paranormal activities became so rampant that most employees refused to use the tunnels because they were just too eerie. Today, only maintenance and security are allowed in them. Today, the county owns the buildings that made up the former insane asylum complex. Although the complex was eligible for the National Register of Historic Places, it appears that time has passed. The current buildings are in a state of extreme disrepair. <laughs> 